So, where was you born? He said that night. Where was you born? He listened to that old timer. He said, well, he said, my folks come to this country in wagon, wagon train. He said, we settled, they settled up uh, uh, up that uh, Members River area. And he said the Indians were still in here at that time when they first settled here. And uh, the late 1800s before they captured old uh, Geronimo and the rest of it, you know. And he said they was in that country then. But he said before they they captured them, he said uh, they he said they killed all of our they killed my parents they killed all of my parents and everything. He said killed my my granddad my parents and all of our relations. He said they just wiped us out. The Indians coming there. He said, but um, I was born right up to the Members River and uh, above San Lorenzo in a little uh, two-room adobe house. And the reason I know I was born there is because I built it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Ah. They kind of, well, I didn't have a, a Vienna sausage training with. <laughs> probably if I had one, I'd probably ate it myself. <laughs> Come in here, young fella, and go over there at that sofa and have yourself a sit down. Would you like a cup of coffee? <laughs> now, folks, if anybody asks you, I can tell you with no doubt that a right smart push is three miles. <laughs> Sid Savage. Mr. Sid Savage. And Arthur Cox. And Arthur Cox. Sid's, I've known Sid since, since a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Cox, I just met you. You guys were playing music. Yeah, there. about a year ago, I guess. About a year or ago. Something like that. Yeah. Sid, how'd you get started with the hounds? Well, my dad... Uh, I had hounds. Here, we... you've got that loop. You've got that wire loop right around your mic there. Take it down. Okay. There you go. My dad had hounds when I, when I was a kid growing up, and uh, we used to go over to, on the Pecos River and, you know, try to catch a coon once in a while, a raccoon, and uh, that was over near Fort Sumner, and we lived over at Melrose, so we didn't get a lot of hunting because there was quite a drive back and forth, but that's kind of where I got started with him. You know, at night hunting raccoons. So is that where you're from, Fort, uh, over there? Yeah, I, I grew up there at Melrose. Graduated from high school there. It's a little old wide spot in the road between uh, Clovis and Fort Sumner. Not much there anymore. Where Where was your folks from? Well, my mother was from Sweetwater, Texas. I, I was born in Texas, uh, and my dad was from Fort Sumner. Did y'all ranch there? No, my dad worked there for the air base. Well, we had a little old dry land farm there. It was pretty tough to make a living on. It was kind of right at the end of the Dust Bowl days, and and there was a dry land farm. There's not enough water, and it, sometimes it didn't rain. You just didn't make a crop. <clears throat> he had to go to town and get a job. 
he uh, retired there at that Cannon Air Force Base in the, util- oh, okay. in the utilities, uh, water and sewer and pipelines and that sort of thing. How long ago? When, when did you, well, you came down here and went to school at NMSU, didn't you? I graduated from high school in 46. I know, 64. Excuse me, I got the numbers backwards. <laughs> <laughs> I always had trouble with numbers. <laughs> See, I was born in 46. I got uh, graduated in 64. And then I, the next year, I think I started uh, school 65 in, in uh, Las Cruces for, uh, at New Mexico State University. Did you ride Bronx in college? Sure did, yeah, I tried that. And tried then it. you also went to the NFR. Yeah, I think I went, yeah, the PRC. I'm, I qualified for the NFR two times. Two, And you went and participated? Yes, I did. Uh-huh. How did you, did you finish in how, very high in the world, or where were you? No, I finished, I think, 10th, two, ta- two different years, 10th. There's, I was kind of in the middle of the pack. They take the top 15. Mm-hmm. You have to be in the top 15 to get to go when they base that on money you've won throughout the year so you have to be in the top money earners to get to go uh in whatever event or events you're in that was saddle bronc no it was bareback oh riding. bareback yeah oh, okay. i worked the same event as chris ledoux did you ever run into chris oh yeah i knew him real well you know i used to hang around with him and he went to eastern new mexico when i was at las cruces so he was in the same region and we were, you know, in the same event and competition. I'll be dang. I'll be dang. And Mr. Cox? Yes, sir. And I can tell by accent you're not from around here. Well, well I'm. you can't tell by how I talk, but I'm a hillbilly from Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from the mountain of southwest Virginia. And... Were you raised there? I was, I was raised there, yes, uh... And I found my way to New Mexico because of my granddad that homesteaded over in uh, Almagorda. Oh, okay. And he had $20 in a three-room tent. My mom was born in that tent in between La Luz and the White Sands. Oh, okay. So uh, it took me 50 years to get to New Mexico. But when I did, it's just, it's home. Oh, that's That's good. That's good. We spend about six months a year out here. Oh, so you go back and forth yeah. too? Yes. And you were involved with bloodhounds. Yes, yes, sir. I retired from the Virginia Department of Forestry, and back in the early '80s, we had a terrible wildfire season. We just ran out of electricity for a minute. The and, wind blew it away. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and uh, in about a six or seven day period, we had 200 and some wildfires. 90% of them was arson. Really? So we beat our, our brains and tried to come up with something that we could uh, help fight this problem. And so I had been toying with an idea for a while, and uh, I mentioned it to headquarters, and that was to train a bloodhound that would track track, uh, somebody that set wildfire, and so I started it. Uh, At that time, it was... When we, when we got it established, it was the first price, the first program in the United States that used bloodhounds to track arson. Did you have a background in hounds, or? Uh, yeah. Well, beagles. When I we grew up with hounds, yeah. you know, Dad was a fox hunter, and uh, yes, I had a I had a background in, but uh, and not in man tracking. Yeah. And uh, I had 30 of the greatest years anybody could ever, ever want. Uh, it was, you did it. So you, you did it for 30 years. Well, almost 30. I, w- I retired at 30 years, but it was a year, two or three before okay. that I started it. But uh, it was quite a, there we go. Quite a program. We lost. We're back now. We keep losing our electricity. That, I, I mean, the wind is blowing, yeah. what, 40 miles an oh, hour out there? Oh, at least, at least. Terrible. At least. 
but where were oh it, it so did where did you get you know everybody's always talking about the nose on a bloodhound do where, do where okay that's that's I used my bloodhounds now you don't want to invest six or eight months a year of training a dog and then it come down with hip displeasure or, oh, or yeah. something like that so bloodhounds haven't been uh bred and been contaminated let me put it that way mm-hmm. like a lot of other breeds uh so i got show dogs in 1980 sometime around then uh I would get a eight weeks old puppy, and at that time, I was paying a thousand dollars for an eight week old puppy. <laughs> and uh, but I got, I always had good results. I had uh, I had one favorite breed that that had a legacy breed that come out of uh, England. Mine was old English bloodhounds, and a bloodhound's old factory system is about three or four times larger than any other dog. And uh, consequently, they've got what it takes. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I would get the little puppy at eight weeks old, that's when I started him. I'd take him home for a couple of three days till he got used to us. And then we'd go out in the yard. And Faye would help me. uh, She would, uh, I had a little chihuahua harness that I put on my little puppies. And then we done the same thing from the day that they first started till the day they died. You didn't change nothing. I put that little heart, and that was their signal to go to work. After after a week or two, they knew when that harness come out, it was time. Playing was over. It was time to go to work. So, but Faye would get a, take her hankshire or something like that, and then I, she'd take a Vienna and a sausage. And uh, she'd let that little dog smell of that hankshire. Then she'd give him half of that Vienna sausage. Then she'd walk off 50 yards. And, of course, that little fella just <laughs> just can't hardly wait, you know, because she still had some of that, and he liked it. Yeah. So then I would just say, find him. And, of course, that dog wasn't no idiot. He just... <laughs> Took off running and he'd run right to her and he'd get half of his uh, half of his sausage. You'd do that for about a week, and then everything the same way. I just put my hand over his eyes. Well, <laughs> she'd walk off fifty yards and then make a left turn and go hide behind a tree. And I'd say, "Find him." Well, just put my hand off of his face and lo and behold, there wasn't anybody there. And he'd whine a little and kind of twist around. And finally, he'd, that little old nose would pop the ground. And, hey, I've got something else here to depend on. Uh-huh. Not just my eyes. But he'd hit that track, go out, and he'd mill around where she turned. And he'd finally figure it out. And then when he get got down there, you great thing since sliced bread, you know. You just uh, make over him. And then you'd just get longer. In distance and longer in time. I had a dog that I started working full time at three months old. So, with that handkerchief, he was trailing her, yes. not the Vienna sausage. No, he was trailing, no, her, he's trailing her for the reward yeah, of the that, Vienna that's sausage. That's exactly right. Yeah. And what we'd do, she'd kneel down, course, just a puppy, and he'd run up to her, and them little feet would kind of go up on her legs, and she'd She'd get, uh, he'd get this treat, and then, as he grew, and if the distance got farther and the time got longer, then when he was big enough, he would rear up on her. Wouldn't get his sausage until he reared up on her. Of course, when he was big enough, his feet come from up to his shoulders, <laughs> you know. Or and when I never did trail the same person over once a week, I had. Ever, different people. You don't uh, never want to just because they'll think it. You know, I don't trail but this one person. Yeah, they, 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 yeah. yeah. But uh, then they'd put their. I'd say, is that him? And he'd jump up on her, you know, and 
he'd get his sausage. Well, when he got big enough, feet up here, he wouldn't get his sausage. He'd just, I'd, until he'd get a, you know, I'd, I'd say, is that him? Is that him? Is that, just get him excited. And finally he'd go, boof, <laughs> he's wanting that sausage. <laughs> so he would get it. And that way, I was looking down the road. Yeah. And when you, if if you're tracking a subject, and uh, he he runs up and he jumps up on you, and them big old that big old head right in your face and his feet, and I say, is that him? And he goes, oof! <laughs> a spontaneous confession has happened. I was going to say that's pretty intimidating. <laughs> yeah. So that's that was the reason behind this continued, you know, yeah. the training and but. Uh, Sid, do you think we've been cheering and our lion hounds wrong now? <laughs> nah, I, uh, my dog was always on a leash. But now when I'd start the puppies, I never put a leash on them. Yeah. It's my belief that whenever you put a leash on a dog, you take 75% of his ability away from him. Because he can't move freely? Well, because he's not free. Yeah. And you can't smell, I can't smell a lick, <laughs> you know. And when you're out a training or when you're out on an actual run and, and you're in the mountains of Virginia, it's not like, a, well, it, up in the Black Range where there's a lot of brush. But if that, if that lead, I used an 18-foot lead, and if that lead got tangled up, he didn't know that I didn't jerk him. Oh. So, so you really, you know, you go through it, everything that you can think of. When my, my dog stayed with me, Eight hours a day, 365 days a year. If there was anything unusual, that's where I had my dog. They rode helicopters because wow. we've, we've, we've rode the helicopters and been dropped out of, not dropped out, but took to a certain mm-hmm. area. Anything we could think of, trains, 18-wheelers, was there anything. Get them used to everything. Get them, yeah, conditions. I, was there any reason for the... Increase in arson at that period of time. You know that that uh, we had most of our programs right in the tip end of Southwest Virginia in the coal fields. Now, sometimes when they'd go on strike, coal field the coal companies owned a lot of land, mm-hmm. and if they went on strike, a lot of times some of the boys would go out and see if we couldn't do a little bit of damage to. Mr. Cold Man, you know, and uh, and this that now, the, and I've I've milled that over my brain. If I knew the reasons, I'd be, you yeah. know, it helped a lot. But I can tell you, a lot of it is excitement for them. They like want to see the red lights and the blue lights are flashing, you know, and hear the uh, sirens. A lot of it is just plain low down meanness. Yeah, some of it is. Different reasons. Some of it, it actually has been proven that it was, uh, they got a kick out of it, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's sexually or whatever. So it's it's every kind of theory you can think of. And you always pay particular attention to young people, and they'll start out with trash cans, fire trash cans, and then it'll just graduate. And, uh, it's just a fascination with fire. It's, it's fascination with fire. Yeah, but I think? didn't. I didn't only run arson. I run. I, I worked in seven different states. I run for the FBI, ATF. Wow. And uh, about every county in Virginia. And you said that your dog. What, what was the line of, do- of bloodhound that you used? Legacy. Legacy. That was an old breed. Did you ever, you ever read uh, Meet Mr. Grizzly? The no. Book that. Uh, what was that guy's name? Sid. Uh, Billy. No. Uh, Meet Mr. Grizzly. Uh, Montague, Montague Stevens. Oh. No. And he was a one-armed guy, and he trained. Uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the bloodhounds. But he trained them similar to you, right. and he had a bet with guys that they couldn't fool his dogs. And and he had guys do everything from uh, ride horses out to piggyback and everything else. And he could well, they could always find the guy that that. I 
I could talk to you all day, and I don't want to take up oh, all your no, time. Oh, no, we're going, but, we got all day. That's what uh, I'm here for. I always carried sterile gauze in a little fanny. I always carried sterile gauze. I always carried plastic gloves. I found out we've not even scratched the surface on what a bloodhound can do. Really? I firmly believe that. The longest track I ever run was 14 miles. The longest time was 14 days. Whew. So now let me get back into the... I carried sterile gauze. If there was somebody that either criminal or just plain lost in the mountains or whatever, if their car was there and I couldn't get in it, I would wipe I would put on a pair. Of, I'd take a, most of the time, just for convenience, the plastic bag that I carry, I'd just turn it wrong side out and put it over my hand. Yeah. Get, break open my sterile gauze, wipe the door handle. Just wipe that door handle. Seal it back up. Let it stay for five minutes or something. And if it was in the wintertime, I would get in the vehicle and put it up on the dash to where the the heater would heat it up. It would intensify the scent. And that's all I needed. And I ran an experiment. At I was a an uh, instructor for National Police Bloodhound Association for several years. And I ran an experiment during this. this I used the same scent from doing this exactly like I was playing. We'd have five or six people, and I had sent from one of them, kept it for five years. And they would all get out there and out here and walk out in the field, and they'd be there, and then they'd go in different directions. We wouldn't, I, me, or dog wouldn't be nowhere around. I'd take that scent, give it to that dog, put him out there. He'd go to that man. I kept the same scent for five years. I don't know how much longer it would have lasted. I don't know how much. But longer. in a sealed bag like that. Yeah. Now, you, I don't. What you said, give it to that dog. How did you give it? I to left him? it in that paper, in that plastic bag. I'd put it on his nose until he breathed, and it would suck him. Then I knew that whatever scent, if any, was there, and he got it. You know. I mean, I put that right on his nose, and when he went, that bag would collapse. You know, and he had been conditioned. Oh yeah, so long to just take whatever scent you gave him. Yes, that he and yes. and and that. Did you have during his training, or did you ever have any trouble with him? I mean, problems throughout that. You as have he went problems. Through? Yeah, you have problems, but you. It's not like. You, you, are turning your hounds loose. Mm -hmm. I had a certain amount of control. Now, you sacrifice some of his ability for that control, and the control sure. is a leash. Sure. So if I, if, if I was going home of an evening and uh, I seen 15 or 20 deer up in the field, mm -hmm. I'd go Get me a little, uh, get me one of my little boys. I always, I gave him a little card, assistant bloodhound trainer, you know. <laughs> and I would take him back, and I'd say, go right through them deer. And he'd go right through them deer and hide. And then that way, I knew, you know, I knew. You don't, you don't play cowboy with Indians. Yeah. I mean, you're not, a, you don't do this. A lot of people couldn't understand. I would mark, I would have my runners mm -hmm. to mark a trail. In other words, they'd put a piece of toilet paper on a stick, I don't mean on a bush as they walked by. I'd have them mark that trail mm -hmm. because, like I said, I can't smell a lick. Yeah. And if I don't know where that dog is supposed to go, how am I going to correct him? You know. So, uh, that was part now. After he got to where that I could pretty well 
know what he's, you know, then the markers didn't go, you know. I would just, oh, you you've got to be extremely careful. Don't start guiding your dog. Uh, you know, and, and we're all human. Yeah. If I see another marker 200 yards up there and he goes this way, I'm going to give him a chance. Yeah. Until he proves to me that he's not coming back. Then, I, right then, I stop him. I take that harness off of him right then. Snap that lead to his collar. Bring him back. Start him again. Get him back on the trail. Get him back on the trail. Pretty soon, when that happens, you start. he'll start circling. And he'll work his way back. You know, you just, patience is... The hardest thing in the world, yeah, to keep from keep from influencing the adult. <laughs> but uh, it's most of the time when I have messed up, when it's been me. It's not been the dog. It's been me. I think we've all been fault. <laughs> 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 it's uh. After you have trained a dog, after you, and, and, and they always ask, how long does it take to train a dog? Buddy, I can tell you in a heartbeat, that dog is trained the day he draws his last breath. <laughs> <laughs> the day he dies, he's fully trained. <laughs> That's like if somebody, I've had guys ask me a lot, you know, to sell a finished lion hound. I said, man, do you have a finished hound? I said, man, if I ever get one finished, I'm dang sure not going to sell him. Yeah. <laughs> but I have, uh, I've been so fortunate. And uh, I started, I didn't know anything, really. Today, I still don't know. A whole yeah. lot. <laughs> but uh, I had a prison that was within. 40 minutes of me, and they ran bloodhounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, they took me under their wing. And, and they uh, helped you. It, it, helped, it helped tremendously. Although they... Hold on know, just a minute. We're having brownouts. Pete. Mine's a little loud. Is yours a little loud? Here. Yeah, we're having... Sorry about that, guys. We're having... Uh, uh, that thing might have turned off and stayed off. I better check it. Well, I'm glad we're not out there trying to trail right now, track somebody. Not I'd love I I know and I believe every word you said I know no, that this is a totally different world out here it's a totally different world I ain't going to be foolish enough to tell you that I'd get out there and run somebody in a day like today well if you wasn't too far ahead you might get well, yeah, well yeah I mean but, but in a day like today if I was within an hour of of him, you can catch it. Uh, uh, I ain't saying that. But if I'm in an hour within, well, let's say let's cut that time thirty minutes. If I'm within thirty minutes of him, my dog more than likely, if he went straight up the middle of that field, uh -huh. my dog would be over here next to them bushes, picking up that scent that drifted. It's where it's where it's drifted. And that's when you've got to have a lot of patience, boy. You've got to have a lot of patience because the dog's going to work. He's going to run you to death. He's going to, because he's looking and they're hunting. He's searching for that. Yeah. And, he, and he'll, man, he'll run you to death. And I don't know whether you all run into this or not. I would love, that's the reason I want to go on a lion hunt. I want to go on a lion hunt. I want to watch. That's the reason that, now, if, let's say, that house up yonder is uh, no houses, nowhere close, or no, but that, instead of being a house, that would be a, a, a thicket like you'd find up in the Black Range. Okay. And somebody, and, and, and then there's, somebody wants to sit there and watch for you coming. All right, and he sits there for thirty minutes. Mm -hmm. Then you've got what we call a pool.
cool scent. Oh, I see. It'll kill you. That dog, he's confused. Here. Well, he he's, run, he's, he's got to find the exit. Oh, I see. And when he's looking for that exit, you, you're running through that brush right with him. you know. Because you've got your harness on, so you're yeah, not with yeah, the dog. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I see. How hard is it to but find I, that exit? But I wonder. Well, sometimes it's five minutes, sometimes it's 30. We ran out of electricity. <laughs> so all of our gear is not working. Yeah, the wind. That wind blew a pole down somewhere, probably. So, Sid, how did you become so fascinated with hounds? Besides hunting coons, I mean, I know that you you, you lived out there in the desert for a long time. And how well, did you start hunting lions? I had a little old ranch leased in that boot hill in New Mexico that hooks on to Mexico. It's between Arizona and, and uh, sticks down between Arizona and El Paso. The boot hill goes down, and I had a little old ranch leased down there, and had cattle on it. I leased it for cattle. It's rough, rocky, and I uh, trail those. You know, tried to catch a coon a few times, and once in a while, in that in them little old canyons in there, you'd see a a line track or a scratch or what they call a scrape. And once in a while, you'd find a kill. And uh, I guess what got me interested in trying to catch one is there, I found a, uh, where a lion killed a calf, and I'm pretty sure it was a lion. You know, there was li- there was tracks there, and they. It wasn't no raccoon that had killed a calf, you know, so I wanted to try to see if I couldn't trail him or catch him, you know, or catch the line. The calf was mine, and, you know, you sell those calves, so that's the way you make your living. And so if they're catching your cattle, you kind of like to try to get him out of your herd so that you can make a living for yeah. your family. So that's why I wanted to. And then I finally got a dog and... uh Tried to trail him, and for you, for a lot, number of years there, I just couldn't catch a line down there. I just well, didn't know enough. Where'd you get your first dog at? I got my first dog from uh, Gary Washburn. He lived at uh, Fort Sumner, and he had, uh, later on, he had a, a line of those Finley River walkers. But the first dog I got was just kind of a, a mixed blood, uh, part walker dog. I think he was part bird dog. He was a white looking dog with a round ring on his uh, around his eye he kind of looked like that dog on those uh spud mckenzie um is that his name spud mckenzie that bulldog on on yeah on tv little rascals or whatever yeah I know that's a, that's kind of what he looked <laughs> yeah. like he was a, but he was a real pleasant dog and i don't know how but he'd been trained you know on raccoons and and uh i didn't have a scent bag to put his nose in and um, I didn't have any line sent really to show him what I was after, but um, like where that kill was, I guess there was a lot of scent around there, and uh, that dog finally figured out I think we was after that line just by going and going and going and going and uh, a lot of a lot of time in the saddle and going through that country and riding through the country riding through the country and and taking that dog with you and if you could find a scratch or scrape you knew you know and i'd call him over there and show him that try to get him to smell of it you know put his nose down there and smell of that and this is what we're after and most of the time i was so far behind they could he couldn't bark on that scratch uh, that's kind of the way I got started. Did you, did you ever get him to trailing? And, and yeah, finally I did get him to trailing. Uh, I finally got him to coal trailing. He was a pretty good little. Now then, I look back and I, he was a better dog than I than I thought he was. Uh, kind of like he said, the faults were yours. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I didn't know what the, what the heck I was doing. I didn't have any old timers that had hunted line to show me, didn't have any old timers to help me. Um, I did go hunting one time with Ray Freeman. Dunk Freeman lived there at, uh, at Hatchita. I lived there. And, and uh, I did go with him one time, and then I went with Ray Freeman one time. And Ray had some, his brother Ray Freeman, he had some good dogs that would really trail. And, uh, of course, I wanted to get my dog in there with his so they'd learn, you know, what it was at, what we were after. And I think they picked up a little experience hunting there with Ray. 
And then one time I just lucked out and went up a little old rough rocky canyon, and there had been a lion in there, and that dog was wiggling and whipping his tail, and I had one other dog, and that other dog uh, bawled on that tra- on that on that center on that track. He started. The other dog started. Other dog started. Other was dog he, started it. Had you got him from somebody who'd been hunting lions? No, with him, I, well, I got him from my dad. He raised him from a puppy. And he was some kin to that other dog, and uh, but he was a younger dog. And uh, I think somewhere in there we had ordered some what they call line scent. It was in a little plastic mm-hmm. container, and we'd put some of that on uh, in a little cage on a, a piece of tin and let a, a, a house cat walk on that. And mm-hmm. We'd turn him out and let him go, and then we'd try to trail that house cat down. And uh, they kind of learned to trail on that scent. They kind of, I didn't have a a Vienna sausage training with. (laughs) Probably if I had one, I'd probably ate it myself. (laughs) (laughs) I kind of got started that way. But it was so uh, fascinating uh, trying to catch one that was, uh, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a puzzle, big puzzle of all the different things that fall into play your uh wind the sun and dry conditions it, it was really hard to trail down in that country it's similar to right around here it's, yeah, it's, it's tough country to trail and uh, i finally i finally looked out and uh and and caught a little old female in there ran her in a mine shaft there was a lot of old mine shafts there and uh those two dogs got in on there and barked at that line. They could see her back there in that shaft. And then after that, I got a little bit better, a little, little bit better, got a little bit more training. But I was real busy with cattle. I had two two ranches leased. I had a ranch leased there from Mr. Richard Faulkner, and I had one leased there from John Smith. And and then I leased one at Nut, New Mexico, and I was busy running back and forth, so I didn't have time to hunt all the time to really get my dogs Going like they needed, trained up. Mm-hmm. It takes uh, a lot. Of, it takes a lot of time. You, they need to catch something really to ca- yeah. to to improve. And you, and that was after your bronc riding or, or your rodeo. Yes, uh huh. Well, that was about nineteen seventy. I think four or five when I started it, uh, trying to catch a line, and I think I went to the finals in seventy one, nineteen seventy one, nineteen seventy two. So yeah, right after that. <clears throat> And, but you've always, you've always had some hounds since then, haven't you? Always had some hounds, uh, but I've never really had enough time to really make them good. Well, yeah, I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think that's what one of the problems with is in this country. Unless you, unless you have that time to hunt consecutive days, <coughs> you know, go out and keep making. Like you said, when you caught that little female, you said you got lucky. Yeah, I got well, lucky. When you talk to Mike Root, he says, well, the only time I ever catch one is when I get lucky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Mike might be uh, trying to hide that really how good he is. I mean, really? he knows a lot more than probably that he would let on. Uh, you learn to watch your dogs, and you learn uh, to trust them, and uh, he, you just gain experience uh, over the years that, you don't gain if you're not out there working at it and doing it. Well, you've hunted with Mike quite a bit in the last few years, haven't you? Well, not yeah, several, some, but not a, not a whole lot. But I sure do enjoy him. He's very pleasant and very knowledgeable. And his dogs, you know, they work way better than anything I've ever had. They work as a team, and uh, one dog will get a scent and ball on it. The rest of them will go over there and check it out and and I knew you can move up, move up. And where I just had one dog with no help, uh, it's really tough. You don't have any really teamwork. You need a couple of them in this dry desert to kind of help one and the other, help the other. And you can move along, move along, move up, move up. Yeah, yeah. I, and, of course, Mike's out there a lot. Oh, he's out there a lot. I mean, I've been up there and... And of course, he takes hunters, but he'll have a he 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 does a ten day hunt, and he'll hunt every day. And it don't matter if it's wind, rain, snow, or shine. He gets up early in the morning and 
and builds a fire there, and uh, boy, just as quick as he can get ready, get his mule saddle and get the collars on the dogs, uh, he has a tracking system on his dog. Oh, you know, you're gone in some direction, and he knows those mountains. He's been in there, I don't know, 40, 50 years, and he knows them by the, like the back of his hand. And he he, he kind of has developed a feel for, uh, I think, which way a line will go. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you can't really trail a line out of a certain spot and, or, uh, because of the conditions or the weather, and you get hung up, like Arthur was talking about, that pool of scent in a brush pile. For mm-hmm. whatever reason, you can't move out, and and a Mike, he can look at that terrain a lot of times, and and, and more times than not, and, and and has a real good idea of which direction that animal went. And they say he's amazing at finding a track. He can see. A track oh, he it. sees them all the time that I don't see riding yeah. along before the you know they may be too old for the dogs to pick up the scent. He sees them all the time, and uh, and, and he'll point them out to me. He's, a lot of times I don't see them. And I guess I should say we're talking about Mike Root, and and well, there's another podcast episode where I talked, where I interviewed Mike Root, and and said I would talk to him. I really enjoy going up there. He's a pleasant guy, and uh, he knows uh, he knows hounds, he knows the terrain, and uh, he, he's you know a true uh, I don't know top. He's top of the line hand as far as I'm concerned. And he, and he does it. I mean, he does it the old-fashioned way. He puts oh. dogs on the ground, <laughs> rides circles. I mean, that's he does. He puts dogs on the ground, and and he said you just don't see the country or get to know the country if you're riding around in a ATV or a pickup. Oh, he, he can't he goes, stand ATVs. He goes everywhere uh, on his mule, mm-hmm. or if it gets too rough, he might get off the mule and walk, you know, for a distance. But uh, yeah, it's just uh, it goes on a mule back and takes a pack mule. And takes a pack mule in case he gets has to spend the night. You know, he has some provisions in there. Peanut butter. Peanut butter and tortillas and, <laughs> you know, a little bit of food and uh, maybe a light and some. Yeah, he's got a little few provisions in there. I told him one time, I said, Mike, do you always take peanut butter when you're out like that? And he looked at me and said, yeah, and a spoon. <laughs> <laughs> a spoon. So... I heard y'all you talking about the the scent pools. Yes, it, it, scent. I mean, that's anytime houndsmen to get together. Pretty soon we're talking about scent conditions, how old of a track we can trail, what you know, what prevents dogs from trailing. What I mean, you have much insight on scent, like out here in this old dry desert. Well, not here. Yeah, I'll be the first one to tell you. I, I would be, I would have to learn a lot here. But now, scent, I have studied scent, and I have been fortunate enough to be around people that really knew what they were talking about. And uh, a human, now we're talking humans, I, I, I trail two-legged cats. Yeah. <laughs> a human... There is a thermal current. Now, this is part theory, part fact, you know. But there's a thermal current that starts at your, and, and comes up your body. And it builds out the top of your head. It just flows off. Yeah. All right. The fragile. You know, you can, and, and out here especially, you can rub your skin uh-huh. and see that come off. Uh-huh. Okay. What happens to a body when you die what's the first thing that happens the minute you draw your last breath you deteriorate start yeah all right when this little fuss that you see fluffing off the minute it comes off you and even before that if it's just laying there it's decaying Mm -hmm. what happens when something decays it gives off a gas that's what your dog tracks. Now, I'm not talking about lines because yeah. I don't know anything about lines. But it, that 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 fridge, or that it gives off a gas. Okay, and like I say, it comes up and it builds off. 
The only way I've had people, the biggest, here I go, I'm going to stick my foot in my mouth, but the biggest con that's ever been pulled on the United on the hunters in this country is this scent free clothing. That's <laughs> yeah. the biggest con that's ever been pulled. They've made millions of dollars off of it. But anyway, the only way you can stop that is a space suit. Completely That'll enclosed, yeah. But other than that, you ain't gonna stop it. Yeah. And uh I well, anyway, let's be getting back on the track. Uh, at one of our uh, yearly training sessions, we had a gentleman from Switzerland, Scandinavia. He was wanting to watch bloodhounds because he trained dogs to find lost articles. I, I'm getting to the point that I want to make to you here in a minute. My dogs were doing things that I did not understand. In other words, when I'd come up on a, on a fire, now I'm not talking about a roaring forest fire. I'm talking mm -hmm. about one that maybe has been contained and it's still smoldering. Places are smoldering, you know. And uh, I've had... My dogs would go right in that, and they'd start turning over leaves. First, I didn't know what they was doing. I'd let them alone, fortunately, but I didn't know what they were doing. But anyway, this fella trained dogs to hunt lost articles. He said that they would use stainless steel rods, you know, so they could pitch them out in the field or whatever. Mm -hmm. In order to remove the scent from that... Maybe there was two or three or four different people. But in order to remove the scent from that, they had to heat it to 1,100 degrees. My goodness. Now, how they, I don't, I'm just telling you what the man told me. Yeah. And he was one of the first to start that because they want them, when they want, they, they want them to smell the metal, yeah. I presume, yeah. or whatever, you know, the lost art. But anyway, that's what he told me. Then it clicked in my brain. I knew why my dogs were doing what they were doing. They would go out there, and maybe it was a, you know, a relatively not hot fire. Maybe it just burnt the top layer of leaves or whatever. They are going out there, and they'd take their nose and turn it over them leaves. They are hunting that scent. Underneath that, yeah. But that's, that was one thing that, that I always... Uh, Learn and patience, you know. That, that, uh, let him do what he's let doing as long as he's not running away. As long as he and I would, I would uh, TC my dog. Just I had TC. He caught eighty nine people. Wow. And uh, in his after he got three or four years old, and I'd come to a fire with maybe a half acre or just something that didn't go, I'd just take a snap off of it and let him go out there. Let him mill around. Mill and around. See what he could do. Probably. But uh, it was a learning process from day one until the day I retired. It's still a learning process because the dogs and dogs don't sweat. They don't sweat. All right. I've run... I would always carry it, or have somebody follow me to where I'd have it but in, in the summertime, especially if we were running a highway or the medium in a highway or wherever the scent was at, mm -hmm. and it was uh, humidity high. I've seen my dog's face get completely white with slobber. You know what, what? Oh yeah. And and you'd have to stop and and wash that off and clean it. Give them all the water they wanted, and then wash their face, cool them back down, and then go again. So there's things that you that that you had to watch for. Now I don't know about out here. I know it's this dry climate. Uh, it would be uh, hard. It's got to be hard. But yeah. I would. At the end of the track, I would do something different at least two or three times a week. They uh, they would climb a tree, 
and uh, hide anywhere in the world you could think of, you know. But we'd have, but climbing a tree was probably the most important thing that I ever did with them dogs. I'll give you a story, okay? Yeah, just, please. Just a, there was a fella laid, I think it's 38 or 3 feet 7, but he right up under this lady's ear and shot her. And he took a 30-30 and that pistol and ran from the sink. Uh, they had already used the state police dog, and he was 90 degrees somewhere else. I never could understand their methods, and I, I'm, I'm not... I'm telling you the facts that I know it. Mm -hmm. They use German Shepherds. German Shepherds are a great dog, but I'll take a bloodhound. <laughs> German Shepherds are good if you're running a, somebody run and you see him or you, within five or six minutes. That's my opinion now. Yeah. Not not down in Shepherds. But uh, they had done use him, and then they, they called me. Well, when I got there, I said, what did he use to start it? Oh, he just took his dog and walked out here around the yard till he found out where the man run. I looked in his pickup and there lay his jacket. <laughs> Had all the sense you needed there. <laughs> well, I got the day and started my dog. And we here we went. And there was policemen and deputy sheriffs everywhere. State policemen and whatever. And uh, T.C. went right in the woods then he started running parallel to a fence and I, I bet that was kind of nerve wracking on your point on your part wasn't it knowing that guy well was he said was what he, what he said uh, is I'm going to kill the first man I see Woo. the guy you was tracking or, or the guy that had been there uh, yeah, before anybody that was a hunting he said I'm going to kill the first man I see yeah. well I had a pretty good idea who that's going to be you had the dog that was going to find but him. anyway uh we were running, uh, and this sheriff was standing on the other side of the fence, and we just motored on by. But he said, you're going the wrong way. The German Shepherd went down here. I said, thank you. Just kept going because <laughs> I followed my dog. But we ran and we ran. And I had a boy that was with me that was the greatest thing in the world, David Edwards. Fortunately, he was our my chief warden in the county. And he he run with me. He could track a mouse across the parking lot. I'm I'm not sitting. He was wonderful. But whenever you see a trap, mm -hmm. then I stop my dog. If I see a trap up ahead of me, I'm not gonna blow through that. Yeah. Because I just I said, "Whoa, TC." I said, "David, go see what you can tell me." And he went up there, and he looked, and he said, come back. And he said, we're on him. It was a rail fence. I see the rail fence up there. Well, rail fences in our country has always got moss on them. Mm -hmm. I knew that if he crossed that rail fence, he was going to skin that moss. I mean, that's just common sense whenever, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I said, he said, yeah, we're on him. He said, he skinned the top moss off that top rail. Well. Let's go, T.C. T.C. went right up there, and he crawled under the rail fence. As soon as he crawled under the rail fence, and that was probably a mile, mile and a half, you know, after we... As soon as he went under that rail fence, he went, oh. I said, David, get on the radio and tell him we're in spitting distance of this man right now. Mm -hmm. Because T.C. was looking for him. He looked up. He'd had people getting trees, you know. He was looking for him. If Now... If he found him, would he go do his roof, his bark well, sure. on a tree? Well, yeah. No, no. He if, he, if he was up that tree, he was going to come down. <laughs> but then he might do the wolf on him. Oh. <laughs> no. Well, he, I don't know. Uh, well, he may or may not have depending yeah. on how, how excited he so was. So you just, you're just watching him. Yeah, and that's watching where he him. And when he looked from, up, yeah. I knew. I told, Well, I in the morning said that and T.C. went. And there was a fence row. In our part of the country, there'll be a 
field, you know, and there'd be a fence row where bushes and stuff grows up. Well, there was a fence row up to there. Well, whether he had had time to think about it, but there was five state troopers lined up, like this, just like this, out in that field. Fence row was here. Here we went, right up that fence row. Well, when we got in about 30 yards, he stepped out. Right, but the state troopers was looking the other way. But he had that pistol to his head. Oh, he had had time enough to think, and he knew that was, when he stepped out, and, that they was going to kill him if he didn't, with, yeah. you know, if he tried to put a. But that was the long and short of it. But the reason I told you that story was because of the training that you use, the different techniques that you use, and then you watch your dog, and your dog's going to tell you something, mm -hmm. you know. He's going to tell you something. He learns to go up to a door and scratch on it. He learns to do whatever, you know, and then you watch your dog. The last, the last thing you want to do is to arrest the wrong person. Yeah, yeah. That's the last thing you want to do because are you on the, the reason I don't blow through traps is when I'm running, now I, when I go to court, if I've seen a footprint, it's flagged in plaster cast. That's another brick in the wall. Mm -hmm. Another brick in the wall. Whatever. It's, it's photographed, plaster casted. That goes to court with me. I will never, in my all of my years, I never took a man to court based strictly on my dog. But isn't you're it, setting a dog up to fail? Uh, it, but a dog, but a bloodhound's nose is acceptable in court. Is that correct, or is that, that something I just? Well, the handler has to qualify. In my courts, the handlers had to qualify as an expert. Mm -hmm. They can't question a dog. <laughs> they can <laughs> question a handler. <laughs> yeah. And the first, I always took. I kept everything like I was telling you. Everything is documented, and I, my book was this thick. Wow. And that went to court with me. And the first thing that a defense attorney would do is just jump right up and say, how come you, are you a professional? Are you, can you qualify as a professional? What kind of training have you had? This, all this, that, and other. And I just, my book is laying right in front. I just pick it up turn it around, lay it on the rail, say, Your Honor, here is every track I have ever run. If Your Honor and the court has time, we will go through them one by one. And the defense attorney can ask me anything he wants to ask me. If we've got the time, the judge will look at the defense attorney and say, This man is qualified. Did, with the dog, I mean... Did you train any other dogs besides your TC dog? Oh yeah, oh. I had eight different dogs. Eight oh, you have? Yeah. And the dog bloodhounds don't live but about eight years. Did uh, have you? Did you have any dogs that just didn't make it? That that, that just couldn't do what you expected of them? I had the long. The short answer is no. Really? Uh, I had dogs that were better than the others. Mm -hmm. You know. Or that, I won't say they're better, I'd say they, dogs have different characteristics. Mm -hmm. You've got to learn your dog. Now, I would know within a matter of time, I don't like a timid dog. Mm -hmm. I don't like a timid dog. Now, a calm dog is great, but a timid dog that will be a trailer and a tractor and trailer come by and eat him, you know. Uh... I tried to stay away from that if I could, but no, all my dogs made it. How did you decide on those legacy dogs? Were they recommended that was to just you? A, that was just the greatest thing that ever happened to me, not knowing a thing. <laughs> just blind luck? Just blind luck. <laughs> I found that uh, she was a show, a show dog person Yeah. and had won a lot. They, I mean, they were all show champions. Big old long year. Yeah, yeah. They were looking. Yeah. But that's. Uh, 
Harvey. That was a, but I can tell you, and I, I'm not bragging, okay? Mm-hmm. I'm going to just tell you what the facts is. And it's, in arson, is one of the hardest things to prove. Really? It's the hardest thing to prove because most time it's, it's burn up or this, that, and the other. Uh, my percentage for strictly arson was 65%. Does that mean you caught 65% of the yes. people that set the fire? And that is unheard of. Wow. With far regular arson cases, that's unheard of. Hmm. Most of the time, I was a big. If I didn't have the dog, I'd have been lucky to have had 15%. So, did you. I mean, did you keep your dogs in a kennel? Did you keep them in the house? I kept them in a kennel. Mm-hmm. But the first thing of the morning, that's where I went. I went to that kennel, opened the door, and they went and got in the truck. After and you all were partners all day long. Yeah. And, I, and then the dogs belonged to me. Yeah. I did not use state dogs. I didn't use state funds. I bought the dog because I didn't want them to come up and say, hey, we're going to get somebody else to handle your dog. Uh-uh. He's my dog. So, I mean, did you ever did you do much besides the human scent with any scent discrimination? I mean, like they do these drug dogs or anything like that? Or uh, you're talking about animal scent, or how did I break them from animal scent? Or, or any kind, yeah, anything or, like that. Or, or, or uh, like I said, I'm working with a leash. Yeah. And the more you get to know your dog, you, you spend. I spent eight hours a day. Or 10 or 12 or 14, 16, 18 hours a day if I was working the dog. 24. Or 24. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, or 24. I would leave home and may not be back for three weeks. Really? In fire season or anything. But, yes, uh, the hardest thing I had to deal with, and, and it's going to sound like I'm, but the hardest thing I had to deal with was probably... Alzheimer patients or kids being gone or lost because they're the most well-meaning people in the world. Mm-hmm. Search and rescue squads and and uh, uh, emergency squads or mm-hmm. whatever you know, local. It's the hardest thing in the world to deal with because when they roll up to a scene like that, they want to be the first ones to find him. Sure. Which is natural. And consequently, it's just like a covey of quail. They're just they disturbing everything. Away. And it takes sometimes me yeah, 30 minutes to an hour to work through that. Just because they're just disturbing the yeah. scent picture or yeah, everything else. It's contaminated. Yeah. It's contaminated. Yeah. But I tend to remember the the funny stories. Uh, uh, like I said, I worked. Uh, for the FBI and for ATF, uh, and was successful about every time I worked well, for them. Tell us a funny one. Okay. Well, let me ask a question Go before ahead. I forget I'm sorry. it. What? That boy with that pistol up to his head, did he shoot himself? No. Or did he shoot you? Or No, no. He wanted to do that to keep us from shooting him. Oh, okay. Oh, so okay. they had somebody talk him, talk him down? Or well, him down. they didn't have to talk him down. He knew oh. exactly. He wasn't going to kill himself, but he wanted us to think that he would rather than us shoot him. Oh, oh you know, okay. Yeah, yeah that's, it, that's, that was the whole thing of him just walking out like this. But the that thing was, of this, what scared the, pardon me, the hell out of me, was when he walked out behind those state police. He could have killed oh, every yeah. one of them. He had a 30-30 reliever action rifle. He could have shot every one of them, mm-hmm. or two or three of them at least. Where were we on that when I cut that question off? Or About what? what, what oh, oh, did it be shot? I'm oh, gonna, no, uh, 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 funny story. All right. Oh, well, okay. I'm huh. going gonna, gonna to tell you one. Now, before I do, let me explain myself. I am not talking down about people. I am not. I'm Because I'm, I am one of them, okay? <laughs> yeah. I'm not talking down about them. I'm, but I'm going to just tell you what happened. And I may have told Sid, I don't know, and I apologize, Sid, if I have. No, that'd be all right. But, I'd like to hear it anyway. But anyway, 
They called me to Scott County, which is a three-hour drive from my house, one night. And it always happens. I'll get a call 11, 12, 1, 2, 3. Everything bad happens after 12 o'clock at night, you know. But it was a three-hour drive. Well, I drove to Scott County. The whole country's on fire. I mean, there's fire for you. <laughs> Went up on this uh, ridge leading in the mountain. Pulled up there, and I said, and Tim... Addington was uh, was the chief warden there, or the, and uh, what you got for me, Tim? He said, "Come out here, man." Well, like you say, arsons don't just set arsonists don't just set one fire. Uh uh-uh. uh When they're serious, they'll set three or four, five. They're trying to get something done. Well, what we do is look for the ones that didn't go. And sure enough, found one about this big. Tim said, come out. And we went out there, and he said, look down there. Look there. That's what he said. said look there. <laughs> there laid a pack of rodeo and cigarette papers without a bat on. So Tim, smart, good, good, smart investigator, smart boy, hadn't touched them. And uh, I just done my thing with my bag, reached down, picked them up, sealed it, you know, and then just... I just put it in my shirt pocket because it was warm in, in my co- under my coat, and uh, we talked for a few minutes. I said, "You going with me, Tim?" He said, "Yeah, I'm going," because he had everybody else doing what he's supposed to do. So I put my harness on. I always put TC right between my legs. Put the harness on him. He had just had one buckle. It buckled under his belly. Took that bag out, opened it up, just smacked it right on his nose. He went, I said, let's go. Here he went. An old trail, right down around the mountain. We went about, oh, I guess a quarter of a mile. And uh, there lay a, <laughs> a Milwaukee's best beer can. <laughs> you know, that, that expensive beer. Yeah. Fifty cents for a six pack. <laughs> but there laid one. Okay. Put a red flag on it. Don't touch it. just put a red flag on a bush or Tim did. Ever about the same distance for I don't know, I don't know how many. But I would lay one. So we run and we run. And finally, we down this holler, and we turned up that holler and went up that holler way back. I had you never know where you're at. That's a bad, that's the thing about this running running a man, and there's nothing like tracking a man. Oh, ain't nothing. That, yeah. But anyway, you never know where you're at. You follow your dog. You're watching that dog. Mm-hmm. Well, went up there, turned up, and there was his shack. Like I said, I'm not talking down about people. I'm just telling you facts. We went there right up in the yard, and by that time it was about four o'clock and three o'clock in the morning. There's a frost on that thick, cold. I Tim said, "What are we gonna do?" I said, "Get up there and knock on that door." Well, there's an old rickety porch killed. It. Tim went up there and he started to knock on that. He hit that door. And it went. <laughs> Hollered this loud and I could Anybody home? Deathly swat. Anybody home? Just kept getting louder. Deathly quiet. And I said, Is there anybody at home? I'm in the bed. <laughs> Sir, I need to talk to you. Are you deaf? I said, I'm in the effing bed. I don't care. Got to talk to you. Okay. Wait a minute. Door's already opened into the kitchen. Light comes over. This little guy about five, six, seven, cold black head. He didn't have on a thing in the world but a pair of britches and his rolled up. Standing on a chair, screwing a light bulb in. <laughs> <laughs> he looked 
down at VA and got down out of that chair and said, you got to wait a visit. I got a whole day, sir, all night. He walked right past me out into the edge of the yard. Very polite, turned his back. In that frost, him barefooted, and he was tanked up. <laughs> he would stand on one foot to warm it up while he was peeing until it got so cold he couldn't stand it, and then he'd switch feet. <laughs> <laughs> now, when this old boy sees something like that, he laughs. Yeah. I don't care who it is. Yeah. Just, <laughs> I laughed. I mean, it was the funniest thing I've ever seen. And it must have took him five minutes. He, now, he had really drunk a lot of beer. Finally, he got done. He come on in. We walked into the kitchen. And there was apple crates and orange crates around. That's what was with the cabinets. And then on top of this one was a can lid laying there and a roll your own cigarette in it. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you kind of file that back. He said, cold, ain't it? I said, yeah, it's cold. And his name was Tony Gillum. He said, come on to the bedroom. I've got a, I've got a fire in there. Okay. Climbed up that chair. Screwed it above. It's darker than pitch. And I'm oh, he unscrewed the ball? Yeah, he takes it with him. <laughs> I'm thinking, here I'm standing here in this kitchen. Now that door's open. Now that now the bedroom door's open now. I, I mean, fellow, you might be kind of stupid standing here. He might shoot you. But yeah, light comes on. He's standing up on the edge of the bed, screwing his light bulb in. Y'all come on in here. Closed the bedroom door. Closed the kitchen door. Went on in there. I walked in, and it was an old metal bed. The Football was about this high. I walked up and leaned back against it. And uh, I looked over and something didn't look hardly right. I kind of flipped the edge of the covers back and get sleeping with a shotgun. So I just stayed where I was at. And he come around and he said, you want a drink? <laughs> I said, Tony. I'm working. I can't. He said, you're missing. You don't know what you're missing. I, I just made this yesterday. I just got running. <laughs> and and now it just clear as spring water, but I didn't I didn't uh, take a drink. He took him a little snort, which I didn't care. You know, it's all right. And uh, he, uh, I said, no, I don't want to drink, but I said, and Tim knew what I was doing. As soon as I opened my mouth, I said, I smoked my last cigarette up here. I hadn't smoked in 30 years. But I smoked my last cigarette up here on a mountain a while ago. And I said, I'm out. I need a cigarette. Tim said, I'm, I'm out. I don't have any. Tony said, I'll fix you right up. <laughs> he walks over to another orange crate and reaches in behind it and brings out. Some cigarette papers with no back on. You know, but anyway. So, uh, then I don't know whether Sid may have seen one back in his younger days. You may have, I don't know. But the old cigarette machines. Yeah. You had, a, they had a band, I mean, a kind of a. No, I like that. Yeah. And, and you had a handle, you put your tobacco and cigarette paper in there, and then you do like this, and it rolls one out, you know. He, he was very polite. He pulled off one of them. Oh, that was a back off of the papers that I sent it to dog. But anyway, uh, he uh, put, got a paper off, and he's very polite. He let me lick my own paper, you know. He put it back in there, put the tobacco in it, and uh, he rolled it over and said, Hold your hand. Why, hell, man, well, it fell out of my hand. It come apart. Huh. Now, you you edit this, please, because I'm going to tell you exactly what he said. When it come apart, and like I said, he was about that hot. He looked up at me, and he said, You dumb son of a bitch, you licked the wrong side. <laughs> 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 Again, 
this old boy's going to laugh when something funny happens. Well, that it I, tickled you. <laughs> it tickled me, yeah. So I can imagine it did, and, and man, I licked it. And anyway, he made me a cigarette, and I lit that thing up, and it like knocked the top of my head off. But anyway, after I'd done that, I said, Tony, got to talk to you about these fires. It's just like you flipped that light switch right there. You looking right in the eye of a tiger. I think, so. oh, God. We're going to have to fight him all over this house. <laughs> I learned the biggest lesson I ever learned right then. And I don't know why. I don't know why. Unless it was the good Lord up above. I said, Tony, I got to talk to you. He said, I told you I ain't talked to you about him. Now, I ain't talking. Like I said, I said, Tony, you're still half drunk, or more than half. He said, yes, I am. I said, get back in that bed. I'll see you. I'll, I'll come by in the morning, and I'm going to get you and take you to Jonesville and buy you the best breakfast you've ever had. I said, I'm going to buy you biscuits and gravy and salt and ham and eggs, and we're going to sit down and have a nice breakfast. He said, you ain't going to try to take me in. I said, get back in the bed. Tim was standing over there going. <laughs> we walked out. I said, Tim, we're going to go. I tied my dog up outside. I tied my dog, and we got through the yard, and Tim looked at me, and he said, what in the world are you doing? You cut that man. I said, yeah, I'll have him again in the morning. What's he going to do? Where is he going to go? He ain't got no car. If he runs, we'll put the dog on him again. <laughs> so I, we went on, got the car. Next morning, about 7 o'clock, I pulled up. And hey, hey, let there be light. I pulled up and it's, you don't want me to quit? No, no, I don't want you to quit. I just want to, I want to plug this back in. You talk a lot about TC. Was he your best dog? <sighs> I won't say he was my best dog. Simply the one that I had was before TC. TC name was for Twin Counties. We live at the counties, two counties that we live in. It's called Twin Counties. Mm -hmm. Well, my other dog was Buford, and uh, I was in Buckhannon County, and he got killed. Mm. car hit him and killed him. So when I got back home, I didn't want to see another dog, but it, I had to be over two or three days, and when I got back home, I was chomping at the bit to have another dog. Yeah. Faye, I told Faye I didn't want to see another dog, but when I walked in, she had already called Ann Lig, and I, but it was another legacy breed, big male, and that was TC. And uh, believe it or not, it was, you, know, you talk about being humble. Yeah. Uh, Faye said, look here. And it had been three days. There laid every penny that I needed. All the sheriff departments, rescue squads, doctors, lawyers, they had, they had the money for me. How did Buford get run over? He was looking for me. Be. I had him staked out, and his chain slipped. Him and uh, and uh, come looking for you. Yeah. I'd went to eat supper, and he'd come looking for me. But uh, he got hit. Anyway, next morning I uh, drove up. I got in my pickup, drove all the way around the mountain, come in. And uh, Tony was sitting out on the porch. Waiting for his breakfast. said, you hungry, Tony? He said, I'm hungrier than a bitch wolf. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, Went to Jonesville and went into a restaurant, and I bought him breakfast. And we sat there and just visited. I didn't mention nothing. We just had a good visit. And uh, I said, he fin we finished. I paid. I said, Tony, you know what we got to do now? He said, yeah. Got in the pickup, and he looked over at me, and he said, you know, he didn't try to get me out in that cold last night and walk me across that mountain. And he said, you was good to me. And I said, 
I didn't. I don't know whether they even answered him or not. You yeah. know, I said, and he said, about that we, we drove up in front of the jail. We went in, went in the interview room, and I said, Tony, I'm not even going to ask you if you set this fire. I know you set this fire. Dogs and told me you set this fire. And over in them in them coal fields and them and them mountains, I mean this will there's, there's bad mountains here, but there's a whole lot more flat area here. Mm -hmm. Half of Buckhannon County ain't got as much flat area as we're, as we're looking at. Yeah. And our Scott County. And uh, he said, uh, I said, right, even, I'm not going to ask you if you said it. I know you said it. I want to know why. I always wanted to know why. He looked at me, and he said, well, I'll just tell you why. <laughs> he said, me and my brother was out. I said, it was on Saturday. This was Sunday morning. He said, me and my brother was out, and we'd drink all day. And we was coming back around the mountain. And said, he stopped right up there. You know where? I said, yes, I know where, right beside the road. He said, he stopped right up there. And he looked over at me, and he said, you're going to have to carry your, he had bought some groceries. You're going to have to carry your groceries and walk home I'm not taking you all the way around this mountain. He said it was cold. It was a long way. Of course, I knew how far it was. <laughs> and he just laughed. He said, you know, he owns that whole mountain. It don't look like it did yesterday. Today, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Tony, so Tony pulls. He pulls some time. And, uh, but... Uh, that was probably one of the better lessons that I learned. Don't treat, I don't care what you do, treat people like, yeah. like they are somebody. Mm -hmm. And don't, I, why I done that, I don't know. I don't know why I done that. But it taught me a very important lesson is that, hey, you don't have to fight a man if you'll use your head. <laughs> a lot of the times, now some of them will force it on you. Yeah. But most of the time, usually had some common sense. Did that legacy had had other uh, had they been used for a lot of scent work before? Or a lot I don't. As far as I know, they was all show dogs. Really? Uh, now I'm telling you, as far as I know. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. But. Uh, I was wondering. I'm wondering if. I mean, one of the hardest things with what Sid and I do is we're out there in country where you can't find a track hardly. And you got dogs that have a lot of prey drive. They want, you know, you go for a while, they they want a trail something. Right. And you they know, will yeah, I was wondering if you that, could train a dog just to identify well, that scent. You there's know, one thing that I would like to try. Mm -hmm. Now I want to go and uh, I want to see, see a lion hunt, but I won't now I'm I do this, I've done it Every time, for third, uh, no matter if I found a footprint. Now this that, that comes into the I, it was fourteen days. The reason I know it was fourteen days, he burnt two barns and a whole passel of high dollar equipment. And the first barn was I found a footprint. The first thing I done, I put my Thing, but I undo the gauze and I laid it right in that footprint. I could have put the dog's nose down in there, but no, uh uh, uh uh, you don't do that. Laid that gauze down in that footprint and I left it there for about 15 minutes. I pick it up and I seal it. I've got his scent. Now, what I wonder is. Could I do the same thing with a line track? Mm -hmm. Could I do the same thing with a line scratch? Could I lay a piece of sterile gauze in that line's track? And if I had kind of trained my dog as a puppy mm -hmm. to, uh, when I opened that and put it on his nose. <laughs> you might get excited then. <laughs> I don't know. But it may give him a foot up. Yeah. Now, if... I, if I was going to work with a dog like that, now this, I know nothing. 
please don't take me as a know it all because I know nothing about lines and I know yeah. nothing. But if I had a maybe a bloodhound puppy, I don't I don't think bloodhounds would last on a track out here. I I really but if I let's say I wanted a a starter dog. I mean a dog that would start the pack. Start the trail, yeah. And I could teach him to do that. And mm-hmm. he maybe he'd maybe he'd trail it a hundred yards. Maybe he you know, or maybe just mm-hmm. you know. And I, now whether he'd bark or not, I don't know. I don't know. My brother hounds didn't bark. They never opened on they the, never on the opened human track. Because I never did encourage it because I'd get you killed. Let them know you're coming. I wanted my dogs to run silent. Now, I did see at the prison when they was training their puppies, barking is a competition type thing, kind of. Mm-hmm. They would turn two or three puppies loose because they had a huge farm, prison farm over there that they run like a farm. They'd turn two or three puppies loose and they'd bark because they was running. Mm, they was competing with each of, other. Yeah. They would bark. But, I don't know whether that would work or not, but it would be a hoot to try. If you had a, but I'd want to start that puppy at eight, ten weeks old. So, okay, well, if you had some lion scent in a bag yeah, already, yeah, and you, and you had your trained hound with you, your trained bloodhound with you that's going to yeah. trail or is going to show interest in whatever you show him that scent, is he going to be, will he discriminate between two different lions? That's, now, you just hit on the $64,000 question. <laughs> there's no two human beings that smell alike. That's right, yeah. Now, whether there's the whether the lions, maybe there's enough similarity there. Maybe a lion is a lion is a lion, but they all might smell just a little different, but they all Sound the same. Kinda. You get you get out there and you got a bunch of trashy hounds that have a lot of prey drive and they're going to want to go trail something and they're out there trying to start a track and you think I don't know this might be a fox or this might be a coyote and you got your bloodhound there with a little bit of lion scent in a bag and you give it to that bloodhound and say here we go this is but what we're I after and he goes over there and he says no I wouldn't do that I wouldn't do that unless I had some physical. Unless I had a track or I had a scratch. Yeah. I don't think I would just pull up in a line-looking area and give him that and say, go, fine. Mm-hmm. I don't think I'd do that. Mm-hmm. I don't think I would. Because yeah. Now, if he was six or seven years old, after he had run, started, or several, then I might give that a try. Yeah. I, I would depend on him. My dad called them strike dogs. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. what he'd call them, strike exactly. dogs on his on his fox hounds. You know, yeah. I, and he'd use one. He had one dog that was a good strike dog, and and that was just as important as a one that could run all night. You know, or sure. whatever. What What's the best dog you ever had, Sid? Oh, let's see. I really don't know. I've. Uh, I've had several that I thought was pretty good. I've never really had, uh, uh, I guess, I guess the dog that was a blue tick dog, his name was Checker, was probably about as good as I ever had. And uh, I got him from, uh, oh heck, the boys live up at uh, my Moriarty. Uh, he was out of some, uh, night champion blue tick, straight line blue tick dogs. He was he would start a track. He would start a pretty cold track. Uh, he was pretty good at starting a track. You you had a walker dog up here when you and I when I went up there and hunted with you here last year or whenever it was that you were really high on. You caught a lion with him over here in the desert, didn't you? Uh, or, or was it a herd? That. Uh, maybe I don't remember what dog I had with me that day, but he's probably a dog I call Cooper, and he's a he's half Walker and half uh, English or Red Tick, 
and uh, his bloodline goes back to that rat attack on the Walker side, and uh, the red tick side is, uh, I'll have to think of it in a minute. It, uh, I, can't, I can't remember the dog that he goes back to, but he's a real well-bred uh, dog. Do you, I mean, do, you, do you prefer registered dogs like that that come from some of that stuff? or I know you, you, you got some dogs from Johnny Clump, too, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I got a good female from John Clump. He's in Arizona. It had been used on dry ground, and she, uh, been so many years ago, I can't remember her name, but, uh, I believe it was Wanda. No, it wasn't Wanda. I, that was one that, uh, uh, Randy Lindsay had. Um, but she was a big help to get started, uh, because she was already trained. Mm-hmm. And she was kind of a Walker blue tick looking female that I got from John Club, but uh, I don't know if those registered dogs are that much better than, uh, say, like Mike Root's dogs. His dogs are just generation after generation after generation of of being used and keeping the top dogs and and uh, kind of developing a line of dogs uh, that have been used for that purpose trailing you know cold trailing on a dry ground line but uh i've come across some of them dogs that are uh registered dogs that have that good bloodline from them uh, world champion night champion dogs both walkers and red ticks and and uh blue ticks and they've really got a nose and i know that some of those walkers are really fast and uh, really tree hard and uh, are really, um, I mean, they're out to catch game and they're fun to hunt with. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I kind of like walker dogs, but I, I'm not, I don't know which one, which bloodline is the best if it's uh, those red ticks. Blue ticks are a little more, I'd say, <clears throat> methodical and uh, stick to it, but maybe a little bit slower. Uh, I'm sure there's exceptions to every rule. I'm not saying any one breeds better than the other. But uh, for the fastness, I believe those walkers are the, are faster than a blue tick or a red tick. Have, have you ever have you ever messed around with the running type walkers like they use down in South Texas on bobcats? I, I got a couple of those uh, one time and used them, and they were... They were good. They could really move a track, and they were fast on a track. But they didn't really tree as good as a... That's a good thing for us to listen to right now. They didn't tree as good as a, a tree and walker. I prefer the tree and type because in this country it's so rugged. They need to tree that animal and stay treed. Uh, I'm old and slow for me to get there. Give uh, me time to get there. Gets, kind, you know, helps me find where they're at. <clears throat> so, how about bears? Do you do you like to run bears at all? Well, not really. Uh, there was a time when I was younger, maybe forty years old, that uh, we did run a few bear and catch a few bear. But uh, they run through there. Uh, they run through that that forest, and that rough, and they go to the roughest country they can, and go over to the top of the highest mountain they can, and. They just try to knock the dogs off and lose you. And, and uh, back before we had tracking cars, I've had the dogs <clears throat> stay on for a couple of days. I, I feel like sometimes they were treed, but I could never find them because they got away from me. Nowadays, you can get on a high ridge or something or where a line of sight, and you can either track it with those uh, uh, collars like we have or that old type. What, I, beep, beep. I call them beep, beep, telemetry yeah, collars. Beep, yeah, beep, yeah, telemetry collars. They're really good to try to help you find where they had because they were so far away that <clears throat> we couldn't hear them and we didn't know where they, they were down the mm. canyon up the canyon over the next ridge or, or where they were at <clears throat> I, I i bought some some more telemetry collars this last year just to double collar my dogs just in case because you know i haven't i've been so busy working i haven't had a chance to go out and, and get up there in that big country but i want to well that's you know like that W, uh, uh, what is it, W? W Supply Hunting Yeah, supply. that's, I, I got those, uh, modern callers from them, and they're, they're good, and, uh, they really help you to try to keep track of your dogs. 
they've got some new ones that just came out that that uh supposed to have a four or five day battery life oh wow because my batteries run down in one day and boy if yeah. you and sometimes you miss a dog at the end of the day and it gets dark and the next day you can't get a signal on him you should you better call and get you some i better update my system yeah 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 they got them there i don't know what they call them tt something i guess i don't know but yeah. they just came out and then they have a sleep mode on them so you can you, you know you can put them to sleep and it saves that battery Oh, there you go. Now you're talking. I think because of the way we hunt, it might be good if you know if you got some good broke dogs, then you could be riding through there. And if your dogs are just hanging tight to you, you can just put them on sleep, save your battery some, and then if they started wiggling and acting like they're going, then you could turn them on. I don't know if that would be a benefit or not. Oh, certainly, I, I agree with you. Just save some of that battery because how many times I know you caught a lion up there somewhere and you had a dog that you lost for, you never found her, did you? Well, we we did. We lucked out and found her. I found her about seven or eight months later, and but really, I just found the I just found her bones. The reason I know it was her was she had my name tag collar on, and also one of those uh, what happened? not the telemetry collar. It was the uh, of course the battery had expired. What happened? What happened? What, well, could you, could what, you tell? No, it was you know she was completely just a few bones and a little bit of hide in the collar. Do you think she fell off a bluff or? Well, there's some really high bluffs there, and they were up on top of that. And I don't know if that line knocked her off that bluff, or whether she treed that line by herself. And she was underneath a pretty good uh, uh, juniper tree, and uh, she may have treed it by herself. I've had a dog that would tree a line by herself. I don't know if that lion came down and killed her because she would. She was real aggressive. She really would stand right there and fight a lion in the face, and she might have. The lion might have killed her. I'm not sure, or knocked her off that bluff. But she was only about four or five years old. And she shouldn't have, you know, died of natural causes. So I don't really know what happened to her. Did she a tree climber? Did she climb a tree much? Or yeah, she'd climb a tree. Uh, it wasn't a great big tree, but she could have climbed a tree and hung a leg up in there upside down. You know, I've had them. Yeah. Get caught. I don't know really what happened to her, but I did find those collars, and I got that collar, and I'd been there laying out there on the ground for about seven months, I think, and it had snowed on it, rained on it, and brought it in, put new batteries in it, and I got that from W, and it still worked. There you go. <laughs> I got a couple collars up there on the mountain somewhere. Matter <laughs> of fact, I got a dog that from Mike Root, and uh, we ran a bear way back there past East Curtis Canyon into West Curtis Canyon. Wow. And I got up there, and I got to most all of my dogs except for him. And I had signal on him, but a big old storm came in. And as you well know, up there, that country can get bad. And uh, I ended up spending the night up there on the side of the mountain. Ooh, chihuahua. And I had signal on him, and then the next morning, I didn't have signal on him. And I tried to get over there to him, and I couldn't get down off, you know, it was right up there off the Animus uh -huh. back towards uh i guess back towards emory pass or back towards railroad canyon back in there where those big old bluffs are oh really yeah. nasty That's i was on top and uh i never could find him i never could find him and i lost signal on him and uh he's up there somewhere with a brand new collar on him yeah I don't know what happened to that dog. That's it's bad but that's, country. That's a deep old canyon, that animus, when you fall over in there. From, well, there used to be a wheelbarrow there on that pass that goes over in, mm -hmm. falls down in there where they had those uh, massacre on those, uh, I guess it was Victoria, killed those buffalo soldiers. But <clears throat> I timed it coming up. I don't know how far that is from the top of that ridge to the top, to the bottom of that canyon on that one wall. But... On a mule that can really travel without stopping, a solid ride, and I mean kind of getting with it, it takes about an hour and 15 minutes from the bottom of that canyon to the top of that ridge. How far do you think that distance is? It's not that far, but there's a lot of switchbacks and everything through it. Uh -huh. I know. That when there's that bad, one bad spot, you know, that did that, that, that wash. Uh, I had a buddy of mine that lost a horse down that wash. It was the horse's fault. Would well, you think that's... You know, a mile on flat country, you could cover that in what ten minutes, fifteen yeah, minutes. Yeah, you know. I don't what know. Do you, do, 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 I, I mean, uh, yeah, on average, of course, I don't have a mule that walks out like your mule does. Your <laughs> mule, you, you probably walk 
buy five lion tracks for every one you start because you go so fast in the country. I have been accused of moving along too fast, not giving the dogs time to work. You you do walk. Yeah, I mean, that mule of yours really walks through the country. But on my mule, I average about two and a half to three miles an hour, depending on the country. And and that's that's as fast as I go. Well, three miles an hour. So that trail that goes off in there, it takes an hour and pitch. That'd be... Uh, three mile. Yeah, I would imagine it is. And it, it's a long ways down. That's in there. just down one side, one canyon to get from the bottom to the top. You go right, but through that wheel by that wheelbarrow and go through that that horse gate or that trail gate down yeah. there, and then you just you side hill, and then it switch backs and forth, and then there's a bad wash right there that Ooh. you cross. And and uh, matter of fact, last time I was up there, it was washed out. You couldn't get past it. Yeah, it's terrible right there. Yeah, mm-hmm. and a buddy of mine lost a horse right off of there. It was the horse's fault. I mean, the horse was out of shape and didn't have any shoes on. I told him, and of course, stepped off and sat back instead of trying to, you know, grab his hind end and cross it. He sat back and just went whoosh, right down that wash. Ended up in a tree. I mean, in a tree. <laughs> It was the dangest thing I've ever seen in my life. It was terrible. I, went, I got mad. I, but we cut the tree. That horse's hind leg was over his head. I thought, he's dead. We're going to have to shoot him. Or he's he's crippled. We're going to have to shoot her. You know, it was a mare. And uh, we got her out and got her foot down, and she was sore. But And uh, I didn't know. This was a long time ago. I didn't know the country at all back then. And so we went on down to the bottom of the Animus, and a big old rainstorm came in, and we stayed right there at that, uh, what do you call it, that, that cabin? The, I call it Apache Camp. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, mm-hmm. we stayed that's right there. there at Apache Camp, and we stayed there until the storm blew over, and then we we rode all the way, or I rode, and Johnny led that old cripple horse all the way down to the Louder headquarters. Yeah. That's 30-something miles down through there. From the Apache Camp to the Louder headquarters, 30 Something miles? Something like that, I think. We ended up there about 4 o'clock in the morning. And what was bad about it was the last thing I told my wife when I left that morning, she said, where are you going? I said, I'm, I didn't own that property up there at that time. I said, we're going to go up there in the Black Range and just just ride a little old trail I found. And I'd never been in there before. And uh, she said, well, what time are you going to be back? Yeah. And I said, oh, I'll be back early. It's not going to take us that long. And she said, come on. She said, yeah, I need to know a time when you're coming back. I said, well, if you don't see me by 10 o'clock tonight, I said, you call the cops. She didn't hear from me until 4.30 the next morning. She had everybody in the world looking for us. And, of course, they won't look for you for, what, 24 hours or something like that, or 48 hours or something like that. I did get in a little trouble about that deal. Yeah, that's it's hard. It's a tough country to hunt. Uh, I think some of those, I think, who was it said, uh, David Wilty, there's easier places to catch a line than in mm-hmm. here. Uh, I'm and Dale Lee, Dale Lee is one of the ones who said, you know, there's some country that you just, there might be lines, and you're just not going to catch them hardly in it. It's not, it's too tough to, to catch them. They're, they they get, know you're after them. Man. I firmly believe that. And they, they're they running for their life. They're trying to get away when you get them jumped. And they know the country. And they know the country. And they've been used to getting through it. And here we are living down here in the flatland, and we're going up there to their environment. And it's it's tough. It's tough to get through. It's tough to get you're a hook mule through there, and uh, and uh, I've, one of Dale Lee's tapes, he talked about doctoring dogs' feet because they get sore, and uh, he used those buck dogs every day, and they still got sore, but and they were tough-footed, but your dogs do tear their feet up in that old rough mm-hmm. rock. It, 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 it bites into their feet, and they do get where they can't go. I bet old Mike's dog's feet are tough, aren't they? You know, they they... I've never seen him have to doctor a dog. Hmm. So I guess his bloodline, he has, you know, bred some feed on him, on a, a good feed on him and with a thicker pad or thicker sole that they can hang together. I mean, like on these modern-day racehorses, there's soles on those horses. The walls are thin. And I think on those real fast, that's just my opinion, uh, on those real fast walker dogs, I've kind of noticed that some of them kind of have a thinner type uh, pad and sole on their foot, and uh, uh, but they may be faster, but their feet are not quite as good as some of them mm-hmm. older. I don't know if you'd call them cold-blooded dogs. That's what they call horses that yeah. are in this country. Yeah, very big old foot. Yeah, uh, the kind of mm-hmm. 
you know, go back to a Mustang breed or whatever, but they call them cold blood. In other words, they're not registered quarter horses. They're not registered thoroughbred. They're just, uh, I don't know why they call them cold blood. Just a cold blood, yeah. Yeah, they're tough-footed horses, you know. Some of them old horses, I used to have one, hardly ever even had to shoe him. His old thick wall on his foot was was thick, you know, like a quarter inch or better thick all the way around his wall. And, uh, of course, dogs have different feet. Some of them have a little more uh, area there and a thicker sole. And they also have different noses and abilities to use that nose. Mm -hmm. Well, do you shoe your mules? I do uh, sometimes. If I'm hunting a lot, my mule kind of gets a little bit tender. And I, I, she, she's not the easiest animal to shoe, but I can shoe her on the front feet. If I got a shot on the front feet, I can go pretty good. Uh, and if I got a shot on the back feet, front and back, I can go real good. But uh, if I just per just had to shoe something, I'd have the front feet shot. You, have you had? Any, have you ever had a mule you didn't have to shoe at all? Well, I, yeah, I've had some of them you could use them four or five days and not shoe them. But if you used <laughs> ride them enough, you have ride them enough and get that ground off and that old granite rock. It, uh, no, I've never really had one. That, I was going to say, you've probably had some you couldn't shoe. Yeah, I had some I couldn't <laughs> shoe, but if you ride one enough, I mean, a, a hard enough every day after day, that they just almost need shoes. You can ride one five, six, seven, eight, maybe 10 days, maybe 15 days, but at some point, you'll get his feet ground off where you kind of get to feeling sorry for him and you want to put shoes on him because you feel yourself having to push him and it takes a lot of work when they get sore footed to to get in to get where you need to go and get those short stepping. How about snow? You ever hunt snow? You ever chase the snow anywhere? Well, down in here, I don't really like to hunt snow because it melts, and uh, you can find a track in the snow occasionally. And and uh, when it's melting, where well, that animal steps, as soon as it starts to melt, to me, my opinion. When it starts to melt, that scent is turned loose, and it's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. When that track's all melted out, it's it's gone, unless he steps on a rock somewhere, and then it'll stick. So I don't like to hunt in the snow because it uh, this just don't stay cold enough to, to keep that track in there. I mean, it might be good in northern New Mexico. Snow is probably great. You know, mm -hmm. we're up halfway up the state, but down in here, usually... Uh, sometime during the day, it, the temperature gets around 30, 32 degrees. That track starts to melt, and and even though you were trying on it, it's tough. To, it, it's hard to trail in. The dog can hardly get it at all unless he gets it off a of brush or trees or uh, where the lion touched it with his tail or his back or something. Yeah. Have you ever traveled very far to go hunt lions? Mostly, I've just been down here in the southwest corner of the state of New Mexico. So I've never been to Colorado. I did live at Chama, and I tried up there when I first lived up there. We did run some bear, but uh, down in here in the southwest Boot Hill country, which is at Hatchita, Twins Lordsburg, and Deming, down in that Boot Hill, and then up around Cavallo, New Mexico, over to San Lorenzo in the Black Range. Uh, about the extent of my hunting range area. Always on a mule, or have you hunted off a buggy or an ATV or four-wheeler? Or... <clears throat> There's just not a lot of roads back in here from Hillsboro up over the top of Emory Pass down to San Lorenzo that uh, are conducive to hunting. I mean, there's, of course... Uh, that road's on mine road. I guess you could hunt that, mm -hmm. uh, road hunt that. That uh, road that goes up to McKnight Cabin, you could probably hunt that. And there's another road in there that goes back into that old uh, country. You help me out with the name there. I've been up there. But there are a few roads you could road hunt and maybe rig a bear or maybe possibly uh, rig a line. But there's so much of it in between those roads that is is... You just have to either go a foot or on a mule to really get in there and hunt it. And if you turn your dogs loose off one of them roads, a lot of times you're four, five, six, seven miles from there if you catch him, mm -hmm. the other animal. And if that's one way, seven mile in, seven mile out, and it could be a lot of 
uh, canyons and mountains to go over. So I usually I like to go on a mule because at my age I just can't go that far. Have you rode many horses hunting, or you always? Like I've a had I did have a real good mountain horse that we could really go. Uh, I don't want to tell on myself, but uh, uh, I got him from Gary Shifflett. He was an Appaloosa. An, 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 an Appaloosa? Yeah, but he was a tough booger. Was he a rat-tailed? Pink-eyed, uh, rat-tailed? I've never seen one. It wasn't really much of it. They all kind of, <laughs> he wasn't that ugly but on his tail, but he made up for it in endurance. Yeah. And, uh, what was that? Chief Joseph, didn't he have yeah, those apples? Yeah. I think that was a line of horses that was really tough, really tough footed, and I think they, they when they was after him, didn't they trail him like uh, I think fifteen hundred, seventeen hundred, eleven hundred miles, yeah. trying to catch up to him, and he had those happy horses in that uh, northern Idaho trail back around to Montana. I don't know if they finally caught up to him. I think, but uh, that's what he had. I'm pretty sure. So they're they're a good, they're a tough animal. Uh, uh, I prefer a mule. It's you know a sm- mules are sm- that old wap horse was rough riding. Jar you. He would hurt, make your back, back your neck hurt, top of your head hurt if you could stay with him. But he, you can. And, and you're and you're an ex saddle bronc rider, so. Oof. Well, let's don't mention that. That you know, that doesn't say much for a guy's intelligence, does it? <laughs> you, did you break many bones, or? Yeah, I've had a few broken bones. Uh, yeah, I've had. Had a few broken bones, way too many. To, I don't want to talk about it, you know. It's, yeah, I think anybody that's been in that old rodeo has had a. If you've been in there any length of time, you've had a few a broken bone. How many Bronx do you think you've been on? You know, I was adding that up. You know, my I've started as a kid, and I think I've been out of that shoot on them bucking animals. I, I think around. About seventeen hundred head, thousand seven hundred head trips. It's amazing you can walk. I mean, yeah, and uh, one of them did jump the fence at the back end of the arena, and, and came down, fell over on that fence, and my leg was right between the, him and the fence, and it broke my leg. And uh, I had another one that uh, I got off, and. Uh, that horse laid his ears back and come at me, and he, I, I was running from him. Hit me in the back of the leg there and broke his broke my leg with his foot. Stepped on it, pawing at me. Oh, some pawing horses, at yeah, you. some of them horses would get you. They're mean. I haven't seen one like that in years, but there was one. There was one uh, that would get you. Uh, his name was Mountain Man. He, I, I, I can't remember the string that he was in, but he was in like, California and Oregon. Uh, he was a great horse, and he would he would hunt you down if he when you got it's off. Like of a him. bull, then he. Yeah, they they come looking for you. He'd try to get you. We, I got to tell you this story. Me, I, I trailed to a kill where a lion had killed a, a doe up there, on a mountain. I called Sid, you know, and and uh, this has been how many years ago? Long time ago. Uh, I can't remember. You remember going up there, and it was up above on that Tin Canyons Ranch up there. And we went in on Phil's up Macho. Oh, okay. And uh, I think we went in on Macho. We might have drove on that ranch because I know I had the key to the gate at that time, or I had the combination. But That's anyway, really good country. They're lion country. Good yeah. country. They're yeah. Pollock. Pollock up there. Pollock. 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 I, I call it Pollock. Maybe it is Pollock. Yeah. But anyway, we went up there, and Sid, get, you know, well, you've been around Sid. He's he's on his best behavior now because he's got a pet a, a, a headset on. <laughs> we go out <up> there. <laughs> he gets a mule out of there, and we go up there, and we go to the kill. And the lion didn't come back to the kill. We couldn't trail out of it. And he's got a mule. He's got a, what do you call it, a night latch? Yeah. you got a night latch. And I mean about every 300 feet down the trail, that li- or that mule would switch ends. I mean, just go wah, 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 about three or four times. Sid growl all of it. And I said, that gum, Sid. You know, you need to get something that's a little more gentle than that, a little funner. Right, ah, this mule's okay. She's okay. But she was just, she was an outlaw. I mean, she was straight up outlaw. Oh, boy, I'm glad I got rid of that mule. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. guy, he has put up, now I'm 70 years old. Yeah. Is a little bit on the damn side of trying to learn how to be a cowboy. <laughs> and this guy has put up with me. 
have babysit me, and there's nothing I wouldn't do for him. He's just oh, one good. of those wonderful guys. We've 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 roped a little bit together. Not yeah. enough, but I want you to get your rope, and uh, we'll park them hounds. I want to rope with you. Wait, I, wait, I've just, seen you win. I, who was you rope? What was that girl's name? Uh, Riley. That uh, didn't Nancy you win? Riley. Yeah. Nancy Riley. Did you win a big roping in Vegas with her? Uh, no, Albuquerque. We uh, won we Albuquerque. Split, that's right. We split. I think fifteen thousand dollars. We split. What year was that? a long time ago. There for a while. That was like 20 I, years. Wasn't that about 20 yeah, years ago? Yeah, it had to be about 20-something years ago. There for a while, everywhere I went. I mean, when I went, if I roped with a girl, I could win a check. And I, She's a good hand. Oh, Nancy yeah. Nancy Rogers, she could get out there and get it on them. And you come in there and cleaned it up. I remember that. Uh, yeah, it was, we rope. it was good watching. That, that got my number raised, too, because we, we won the roping by, we left. I mean, we were probably, you know, 10, 15 seconds ahead of the second place team. Yeah. We, she turned some nice steers. And, but, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I miss roping. That's, I miss roping from time to time. It's the only, it's a really the only social thing I do besides coming and talking to guys like y'all. <laughs> well, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's, it's competition. It's like, you know, a golf game or basketball or whatever you do, you know, everybody's got their own thing they like to do. And Sid got Sid got mad at me one time. We were roping down here, and it was one of these ropings where the money was all gone. There was they had already filled all the holes for the money, but you still got points up to a certain certain place. And I didn't realize that Sid was still running for the saddle to win the saddle, and we we had no chance of winning a check i needed the points and he needed the points and and uh i wasn't paying attention to what i was doing i don't know what i did i probably missed and he got mad at me he said hey. what? he said what are you doing and i said what do you mean he said well we i need the points <laughs> <laughs> now when sid is competing he is competing now he I wants know. to win I know, I know the feeling. I think everybody that's entered in there is the same way. They all, well, everybody. They, they, we don't get in there just they, uh, donate to they, the cause. They, they might not be as intense as you are. Okay, well, <laughs> yeah. Oh, Joe Mara used to say, you know, well, when I look over there at you, and I rope with Joe a lot. He's eighty. What's he? Eighty-five, eighty-seven yeah, now. Yeah. And he said, I look over there at you, and it looked like you just had your ears back. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he backed his ear. I can't remember what no, it was. I Competition is something that gets in your blood. It does. It gets in your blood. I, 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 that's the one thing I really miss. I enjoyed competing. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I really enjoyed I enjoyed going to the big ropings and, and having that feeling when you back in that box and you oh. know that you're you're roping at a bunch of money and, it's just something that gets in you. Well, there's a lot of camaraderie there, too, amongst uh, the competition. There's guys in there that you know and guys that you like, and they're just as competitive as you are. They're just as talented as you are, and it's a very uh, competitive uh, feeling. But you seem, if you can seem to prevail and get a place in there that's third, fourth, fifth, sixth, maybe win, you you. It develops a certain amount of respect, I think, among your fellow competitors. And uh, I don't know how to explain that respect they give you, but uh, it does develop over over it does. time. Yeah, you, you're respected for your for your abilities. I mean, and, and and people, you know. And then one thing, you might be competing them against them, and you might want to beat them, but but when they beat you and they win, you go up and shake their hands. Yeah, that was a good rope, and you roped really good. You know? Yeah, and, I, and you're glad to see them win, too, because yeah. they've worked hard at it, you know, and they've uh, honed their skills and, uh, you know, got as good as horses they can get. And and really, uh, some of them deserve to win, and I'm proud when they do win. I, I'm i glad to see them win, or a place. You know, we call it a win if you, if you get a check or get in there. Okay, we'll put it back with the hounds. Where we go, Sid and I get to talking about roping. We we'll be here all, all night. Base, yeah. If you were going to go, if somebody gave you said said here's here's twenty thousand dollars. Uh huh. Where would you go buy a hound at for lions? 
Ooh, I don't know. You know, a lot of people won't sell a really good dog. 20000 might not buy him. You know, if I had a really good dog and I was taking hunters uh, that I wanted to, you know, really try to get them one because they come out here from New York or, you know, maybe a big city and they'd really like to get a trophy. So if you had a dog that could really help you uh, fulfill their dreams of, of catching a, a a line that hadn't been caught before, and there none of them have been caught before. They wouldn't be there probably. But uh, I don't know if twenty thousand would would. Uh, some people wouldn't sell their good dog for twenty thousand. But if if there were, you know, uh, where would I go to buy one? Yeah. Do you have someone? I mean, do you, would you have someone in mind that? Who. I don't really, you know, my group would have a dog, you know, that would fit the bill. He's got several of them that would really be the top of the line dog, but I don't think he'd sell one. I really That's how he makes his living. I don't think he'd sell one of those dogs. He's raised them since they're pups. He grew up with them. He makes his living with them. They're part of the family, and I don't think he would. I don't think he could sell a dog. Maybe it wouldn't be worth that. Yeah. But he, he just. He wouldn't want to part with them. It'd be kind of like parting with one of his kids or his wife or something. They're part of the family. So I really don't know uh, who who you'd get a dog from. It's it's hard to uh, uh, it's hard to say. I know a lot of people go over in Arizona and you uh-huh. know, Clump, Steve Smith, right? Derringers. I right. know a bunch of people. David Welty had some really good dogs. I don't know if he still got them or whether he'd sell one. You know, is he still hunting, taking hunters I'm, and everything? I'm not sure. Huh. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm just not sure where to go to get one. Yeah, that's I'd have to think about. It. That's a good question. Yeah, I I always wonder what where people. You know, I know I know Derringers have sold some really good dogs and and. Uh, and they get top dollar for them. I mean, they don't, they, you know, they don't, they don't sell them cheap. I anyways. think Rankin got a couple of Rankin Lindsay got a couple of older dogs a few years ago, and they were really good. They yeah. really did help him get started and help him get some dogs trained up. Derringer, yeah, yeah, dogs. So you, that might be a place to go. Yeah, yeah. Well, what else do we got? You got some more good stories in the bloodhounds. Bunches. <laughs> Bunches. 80, 80 something though, huh? Yeah. Uh, we're talking about scent and what we can do and what we can't do. They called me over in Buckhannon County, which is another coal field county one night. And this is a, I got a, uh, like I say, I, I don't remember the bad stuff. Oh, I do, yeah. but I don't talk you about it. You try to forget it? Yeah. I, I just try the humor. But they had had a fire up on top of this big old mountain, and I had seen, found some sticks that they they either broke to a fire with, or I knew that they had been cut off, you know. So I did my thing, same thing, with the scent. I gave it to the dog. Those mountains are so steep. And the, where the coal fields are, what well, they mine coal, they're called benches and strip jobs. And the road will just circle a mountain and come, you know, come back down and around, you know. So I was running. And, and uh, this is uh, one of the times that, that uh, I was kind of buffaloed. Uh, but we run and we run and got down off of the mountain to a hard tough road and Lost everything. Just lost. But what had happened, see, that, that may have been 15 or 20 hollows in that mountain, you know, around it. Mm-hmm. What the dog had done, he had put me in the right hollow. Even though that, and it's one of those times, you never know. No, nothing's perfect, nobody's perfect. Mm-hmm. But I lost the scent right at the mouth of the hollow. And, uh, this was at daylight that time, just just about 30 minutes after daylight. I'd run all night about it, but uh, uh, the the road turned up a hollow, kind of south. And this uh, little house was sitting down across a branch, stream of water. We call them branches, you know. Uh, so I decided, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna go and. Just talk to these people a few minutes. 
Well, went over and knocked on the door, and uh, this little woman, she couldn't have been over hardly five feet. And she looked up at me, and she just had one eye. The other one was sewed shut. Uh, sewed shut. But uh, like I say now, I'm not talking down. Because I've, I've been there. That's where I was raised. So I don't do that. But anyway, uh, she looked up at me, and she said, Well, come right on in here, young feller, and have yourself a sit-down. <laughs> Well, the wild horses couldn't have drugged me away then, you know. And she was standing and she said, and she kind of turned around talking over her shoulder. She said, hey, Emma, which was Emma. Everything's an E-R, and, you know, at the end of the night. Emma, come here. They were two old maid sisters living together. In walks this woman. If she wasn't sick, sick, she wasn't nothing. <laughs> sisters. And she was about as big as a pencil. <laughs> and they said, come in here, young fella, and go over there at that Sophie and have yourself a set down. Would you like a cup of coffee? <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. I really wanted a cup of coffee. But we sat down. I sat down on the sofa. <laughs> she brought me one that would have floated two mule shoes, you know. It was stout, but that was okay. And we, uh, you don't never uh, start what you come for right offhand. You pass the time of day, you know, you talk about the weather. This and Finally, I said, is there any mean boys lives up this holler? She said, the little one, Effie was her name. Effie said, Mine? What you talk? Mine? Now, you had to see them eggs out there in my front yard where they throw them old eggs and hit my house. And there's eggshells. You, you walked right over them. Now, them old boys come up through here, and they throw them eggshells out there. She said, yes, there's some maintenance up here. And... uh she said, you know, me and Emma was laying here the other night, and they walked up through that road, and they started throwing them old firecrackers. Uh-oh. And she said, Emma, you can lay here and take this if you want to, but I ain't a-gonna. <laughs> said, I grabbed Pap's old gun, and I was out there on the porch, and I lit far. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, I hit one of them, too. I know it did. Said he was running down through there and jumped the branch and said, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. And said, I said, what do you want to call on the Lord for when you're out here doing the devil's work? <laughs> <laughs> Make a long story short. Dogs help you. You'll know more when you leave than you knew when you got there. Yeah. He put me in the right holler. We didn't go. But. They were riding four-wheelers. Uh, I had picked up a four-wheeler track up there on that mountain. They rode four-wheelers. Well, I had plastic cast, or did, yeah. did do it, plastic cast that four-wheeler track. Went up that holler. There's three four-wheelers in the holler. Two of them wasn't running, or I had the transmission out, and the other one didn't, and it matched my tire. Uh so, so you trail to that holler, that's right. and then because and then, the and then you do your leg work, and then you had the plaster cast at the start of the tire track, so you could identify okay. it when you got to the yeah. to the to it. Yeah. You made, got you. But close. That's the a, dog got you close enough to find yeah. out. I have learned so much, and these older people, I love them. I love them to death, and I listen to them talk all the time. Another little. Story. I didn't. I wasn't a dog story, but it was right along the same thing. I would go out of my way to talk to him. We was sitting at a store eating Vienna sausage and crackers. You know, you eat whenever you can because you're going to be gone. Mm -hmm. And this older like lady come in with her daughter, and I walked out right up to her and introduced myself, and she introduced herself, and says, "I said, do y'all live around here close?" She said, "Yeah." 
She said, my daughter lives down here at the mouth of the holler, and I live a right smart push on up. Well, that got me. They left, and me and David, David come out, and I said, David, let's go. He said, wait a minute, I ain't finished my sardines. <laughs> he said, let's go. I said, let's go. We got to go. She said, what are you going to go for? I said, I got something I got to learn. We went down there, and sure enough, the the uh, daughter stopped and put her groceries up on her porch. And then she went on up a holler. Now, folks, if anybody asks you, I can tell you with no doubt that a right smart push is three miles. <laughs> <laughs> so don't forget that now. Right up here in the animals let's tell them say it's a right smart push on up oh, animals no. creek yep to the top <laughs> I must but something. the dogs have I have been so fortunate and, and so thankful that, that I had the opportunity mm -hmm. to learn a little bit just a smidgen about scent mm -hmm. and about don't ever think that you're the smartest animal in the country. Yeah. It helps to be just a little bit smarter than your dog or your horse or yeah, but but don't ever think that you are. Yeah. Because they can make they can put make you eat some humble pie. I know in the past I've sure gotten in the way of my dogs several times. We do it. We do it. And, and you know, but we're human. Yeah. We're human. But the uh, the scent is a fascinating thing. You, it is a fascinating thing. Do you miss the bloodhounds quite a bit? Doing that kind of work? The hardest thing I've ever done. Quit doing The it. day I retired, I knew, I knew. But the day before I retired, I took my dog, and she was a wonderful little jip. I took my dog, and I gave her to a rescue squad. Oh, okay. Because I knew Faye and I were wanting to travel, and we've been so lucky. We've been able to come out here and know this guy and be for 20 years. And I, I knew that I'd never quit. Mm -hmm. I would have never quit if I'd kept a dog. I would have never have quit. Yeah, because it's it, it, it's like you say, talking about competition. It gets in your blood, and there's no feeling in the world like training an animal or or doing the best you can do, and then he walks up and licks a three or four year old kid in the face that's been gone for that's three or four hours. Yeah. No feeling in the world like it. I bet. No feeling in the world like closing that jail door and hearing that thing go, chick, chick. <laughs> and you caught him. And uh, so, you know, it, it's I've been extremely blessed. Do I? I knew enough. I knew enough, finally, to let my dogs alone. Yeah. I knew enough to let them alone. And that, when I finally f figured out that, it helped me a lot. I, you know, I got a question that how often, like if you didn't, how often did you have to work your dogs on a track oh, I to keep my, them sharp? I worked my dogs at least four times a week. So you had them trailing something. At least I had them trailing somebody four times a week. Just yeah. setups until you had yeah. a chance. And to I, what I would do, uh, I would one evening, I would take a somebody. I used a lot of twelve, thirteen, fourteen year old boys, mm -hmm. and I would take them and let them lay me a a, a mile track or whatever, and uh, then I would go pick them up, mm -hmm. take them back home. Well, that, then the next morning, 12 hours later, or 14, 16, uh, I would go to their house, pick them up before school, take them to the end of that track. Then I would go back and run that track. And then when everything was 
take them back to school or whatever, you know what I mean? But that right, that was a every, that was, yeah. you don't overwork your dog. Mm-hmm. But I, I still remember going up there to the National Police Bloodhound Association schools, and I would have, they would give me five people for a week. And boy, you work from daylight to dark, and you run tracks that was anywhere from two hours old to 24 hours old. Uh, but the first day, it was always fun to get there, and here come these dog handlers. And <laughs> first thing they don't do is line. <laughs> with their handlers, dogs out with the handler. Yeah, dogs handler. with them. No, but the handlers, you know, they'd all gather around and they'd be, they'd say, okay, you know, I'd call out the names and I'd say, you, 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 you're mine for the week. And they would start talking about their dogs. How good, how, you know, I, my dog, this, that, and the other. They go and they open that door on the back and that dog jumps out on the ground and his toenails is that long. Yeah. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that tells me something pretty quick. Yeah, you got an idea then. <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, uh, but it's, uh, it was it was good so life. What kind of conditions, I mean, you, did you have conditions that just blew things up that you couldn't win? I wouldn't tell you, that I wouldn't eat a bit more. I wouldn't tell you what I could have done today. Yeah. Well, I told Sid, win like that. If if he went straight up the middle of that field, my dogs would have been trailing him over there next to where that brush is. Been that scent off. would be that be. A I've run people right down through the middle of towns and cities, Car, traffic everywhere, people everywhere, and I'd be a running. Maybe if he walked down one sidewalk. And the wind blowing, or the cars, the cars will take that scent, blow it up against the walls. You know, you're mm-hmm. going to be, if he walked out right in the edge of the street, you're going to be running over next to the building. And if there's an alley there, that dog's going to go about 50 yards down that alley and then turn around and come back. Because that traffic, that stuff, that, that moves that scent. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's what you got. You, you, you learn that stuff. Mm-hmm. You you learn that stuff. You know, I I I hunted with a lady who had uh, she had hunted with an old time land hunter out of California quite a bit, and she was real knowledgeable. And I was up there on the macho, and uh, my dogs were down there, and they would just they'd bark here and ball here, and I thought they were foxing on me. Well, we call foxing, yeah. you know, they were trying yeah. to trail a fox instead of a lion. I said, oh, I think those dogs are foxing. You know what? That old white dog of mine would go, and he would he would go to a rock, and he would smell around that rock, and he would open, and then he would might cast around over there, and he might open up over there next to next to a rock. And she said, "No," she said, "I think they're trailing a lion." And I said, "Well, how do you know?" She said, "Well, I just think they're trailing a lion." So I, you know, I was being lazy, but I got off my mule and I climbed down the side of that mountain. I got to look, and I'll be dang if I didn't find a little lion track about that big around. Mm-hmm. And uh, I asked her, I said, well, what made you think that? And she said, well, that scent, she said, it's just holding in those protected places. And he could just smell it in those protected yeah. places. He can't trail him, but he can find it in those protected places. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I've had, I know, I probably shouldn't say this on the podcast because I've had guys make fun of me. But I know I've smelt four-day-old lion tracks. Oh, I couldn't trail them, but I could. those dogs would open in I certain have, places. I have absolutely no trouble believing that. Yeah. And, and, and you know, we couldn't really, I mean, we, we, I imagine someone like Mike could look at the country and kind of determine where the lion mm-hmm. has gone, you know, just because he's trailed so many. He knows the travel habits of a lion. And I guess sometimes, and uh, but usually I guess wrong. But that's what they say, like Orville Fletcher. They said Orville Fletcher, that he, that's how come he caught so many lions. And he just knew where they were going. Yeah. He just knew how a lion thought. And, and when those dogs would have a bad we call lose, I guess you probably would too. He could just look at the country and say, that lion went right through that saddle over there. He went yeah. up that hog back or whatever, you know, and he'd move his dogs over there and pick it up again and go. But, yeah, I know I've, I, I, you know, because I know, oh, well, I trailed a lion 36 hours old through, yeah. a, through a camera well, that I had. It's, time never did bother me. Yeah. 
time there, they never bothered me. I had brother ran run a. This going to sound really funny, but I had brother ran run a eight hour old track than I had a ten minute old track, because it settles more. Yeah. It settles. It settles more. It's not up here floating around. How about barometric pressure? Did you ever pay attention to that? Yes, sir. I, you don't. You, you don't disregard nothing. Oh, everything adds you don't to dis- it. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's. Uh, it makes a difference. Yeah. Everything in nature makes a difference. Uh, I seen some coffee in that pot. Is it? Could, could it I just? I just warm oh, up a cup. Please. I'm a caffeine addict. Thank you. I just. But. It, uh, excuse me? Oh, well, I, I like coffee just anyway. I can get it. <laughs> I can pretend just black. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. But it's, uh, yeah, you don't, uh, you learn everything. So, now, this is, this is, uh, uh, I'm going to have another guy that, that gets on my, we're going to do a little live deal on my YouTube channel from time to time. And him and I, he's starting to document He's a bobcat hunter down in South Texas, and he's starting to document the barometric pressure because we have different ideas about a lot of the old-time bobcat hunters said they wanted a low pressure where the scent would be rising, and those dogs can lift their heads up and run that scent That might be good on a fresh track. Exactly, and that's what most of those guys run down there is a fresh track. They're not going to cold trail a lot of those bobcats. But if it's an old track, I'd say you'd want it pushing down. Gonna have to if you want. You're gonna have to. Okay. So if you have that high pressure, it's holding that scent down, and that dog's trailing. Does that sound? Does that? Does that make sense to you? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Tell you something else. I have pulled my dogs. If I, if I'm trailing through a the, one of some of the hardest tracks I've ever run, you'd think it'd be the easiest. Well, some of the hardest tracks I've ever run has been through a cattle cow pasture with grass. Mm-hmm. Now, if I'm running at uh, 12 o'clock and and then it it starts to frost, I'll quit. Locks that scent. I down. will quit. I will wait till in the morning and that sun starts coming up and that frost starts melting. That scent comes right back. That's I, I've trailed on the sunny side of the mountain. And then come Same across thing. to the north side where it's frosted over and you just quit. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. yeah. Scent is uh, the least understood thing that 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 we have that we had to deal with. You sure. know, and because it's theory. Mm-hmm. It's theory. It's not fact. Yeah. I, I don't know of a machine they've made that can smell. No. We're still operating on theory, but. Uh, it's knowledge that you have picked up from here, there, and yonder. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. I got it. So, so now I also I read some scent books. What about uh, when they go through the grass, breaking of the grass and the bacteria that's released when the grass is bent over? Now. You're getting into where our state police has a theory that their dogs no, I got they, they don't they don't depend a whole lot on human scent. They're, I mean, on, on a, their one of their theory is that their dogs track crush vegetation. Yes, that's what I read. Yeah. Uh, I, oh, I I think that can be one. Part of it, maybe one one. If it's divide, if you divide it into tens, it could be a tenth of of the what the dog works. In fact, when they went to lay a track, they wouldn't have a scent article. They'd go out there and spin their feet in the leaves. And then well, go. that would you'd think that if you if all you did was train your dogs to trail that, and then if a, if an animal got up and moved, they yeah. might just trail off on that. Yeah, nah. So yeah. Uh, I have, I have definitely. That's that's one of the, the theories. Hmm. But, uh, uh, so you you do what works for you. How about how about right or left hand turns? 
Is there a theory on right which, or left hand turn? I mean, is there one they take easier than the other? <laughs> I've never, I've never, never picked that up at all. You know, I don't I think dogs are right or left handed. <laughs> I think I read that in a book one time that it's easier to train a dog to take a left hand turn than a right hand. Uh, yeah, but you know, I, I, mean, I won't, I won't, uh, I won't argue that because I don't know. Well, I've never, be, I've never noticed it. My no. grandpa says that paper will sit still. You can write anything yeah. on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there is, uh, you know, I know one guy that was one instructor up there, and he thought he had the world by the tail now because he he started using a vacuum cleaner. To vacuum the sin up. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's this. I mean, you run into the, to stuff like that. And, uh, what do you guys think? You got anything else, Sid? To you want to? Uh, one thing, uh, you know, uh, Randy Lindsay's got some real good dogs. I don't know whether he'd sell one or not. But uh, I know he's got some really good dogs, really? and I think they're really trained up, and I think they've had quite a bit of success. And uh, he lives up there above Hillsboro, mm-hmm. and uh, his wife told me they're going to move, and I don't know if a fellow might get one from him, but I don't know. You know, you just have to go to him and talk to him. Yeah. And I know and he, he, but I've, I've hunted with him a little bit, and I know he's got some really good dogs. When I first moved up there, <clears throat> he had... He had sold a pack of dogs for a bunch of money, and then oh. and then he, he he they started putting some more dogs together. After that, that's when you when I guess you had gone up there and hunted with him some. Uh, yeah. Did I say Randy? I meant Rankin. Rankin, yeah. Well, Rankin's got some really good dogs. Randy had some at one time, and they were really good. to pretty good dogs. Had a lot of success, and uh, and I don't know. I think he did sell some. That's his dad. Yeah, Randy sold those dogs, but Rankin is the one you're talking about. Rankin, yeah. Did I say Randy? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Rank, Randy. Uh, Rankin has some really nice dogs, and they're trained, yeah. and they really can trail and you, catch. He's yeah. got some in there that are fast, and he's got he's he has a really good pack of dogs. So you guys want to play some music real quick? <laughs> well... We can give it a shot.